minutes in. See you on the lift. Back attack, dude. <laughs> Fun for you! Hey, yo, homies. <laughs> Slide down the big hills. You know what I mean? On the big night, burgundy snowboard. All right, it's a big day here at the Bomb Hole, which is presented by Pub Beer. And, of course, run through a wall smelling salts. Now, uh, today we got co-host Jeremy Jones in the booth hosting. How are we feeling today, Jeremy? Feeling good. feel like I've been in here for a minute, so I'm feeling refreshed and happy to be here. Thank you. We're happy to have you back in the booth. And, of course, the man behind the scenes running the boards back there. We got Silk D. Silk, how are you doing back there? I'm doing great, Chris. Thanks for asking. You're doing God's work is what you're doing. Yep. True it's all that. part of the plan. And, of course, our guest today is legendary Mike Hatchett in studio. Mike, how you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks. We are so happy that you're here. And for our listeners that don't know who you are, which is probably very few, uh, Mike is a legendary filmmaker. He's an instrumental brick in the foundation of snowboarding. Since the beginning of modern day snowboarding, he's been pioneering big mountain lines, raising the bar in filmmaking, and continually pushing the progression of the sport through his videos for the past 30 years. Uh, this is going to be a monumental podcast conversation with Mike. But uh, first things first, uh, let's just, instead of going all the way back, let's just start with what uh, what you've been up to. I know you took a brief hiatus from filmmaking and snowboarding and you're back and I'd love to hear you talk about what you got going on. Yeah. So um, this year we're releasing a movie, Flying High Again, and I directed the film and it's in conjunction with Teton Gravity Research. They're the, they're the production company. And the world premiere is October 12th in Reno, Nevada. And then we're going to do about a 60-stop theatrical tour with the film. And it's, it's, a, it's a snowboard movie. It's a high-action snowboard movie cut to music with really good snowboarders in it. Wow. Love to hear that. Uh, what's, the, what's the roster looking like? I know my boy Bodie has some footage in there, right? Oh, yeah. The, the roster is pretty heavy hitting. It's definitely heavy hitting. It's a uh, Bodie Merrill, John Jackson, Jason Robinson. Mm-hmm. We got Brandon Davis, Elena Height, Rylan Bell, Nick Russell, Danny Davis. Um, th- the list goes on. It's um, the roster is heavy, and I'm I'm stoked on it. We didn't start the movie till March, which is a late start when you're making a snowboard movie. And I was nervous to even start doing it at that point, but. As most people know, we had an incredible winter last year in Utah, Jackson Hole, Tahoe. Amazing winter. And we were able to get a lot of good footage and make a film that I'm proud of. You didn't start until March. Why? March. Because we um, White Claw is the main sponsor of the movie, and we didn't, ha- we didn't even know they were sponsoring the movie until middle of February. Teton... Um, I'm old friends with Todd and Steve Jones, the, uh, the founders of Teton Gravity, and they called me up in mid-February in a little bit of a temperature check. We might be wanting to make a snowboard film. Um, we're waiting on a couple things on our end, and yeah, third week of February, they called with a green light and asked me if I wanted to make a movie, and I kind of said, you guys are crazy. Yeah. You know, it's March. Um, so there was some back and forth, definitely. There were some, we had some initial hype and some phone calls, and then the, then some, it really, and then at one point it almost just went away. We were, I was like, it's too late. It's just, it's too late. But I talked to Danny Davis, talked to John Jackson, and they both said they were interested in doing the movie. And once those two guys said they were in, it kind of just happened from there. I'm like, well, if those two guys are want to throw down and film, that's a good starting point. And then we just started calling other writers. Bodie was stoked. J. Rob called me up a couple weeks later, and it just kind of just happened from there, you know. And just, but at first I was definitely nervous. I hadn't been in the game in a long time, and it's late in the year. How long of a hiatus was it? Yeah, good question. Uh, Ten years. Ooh. Wow, really? Yeah. yeah. Man, I was talking to Dogger, and he said something—not a direct quote—but he said that now that you're back filming, it's like you know, not verbatim, but it said like you said it was what you're supposed to be doing, basically. Something along those lines, like it's your calling, right? I feel like, yeah, I've always been so passionate about filmmaking, photography, filmmaking, snowboarding, and I just felt like I was back home. Mm. It just felt so. And I, I literally got out in the backcountry with with John Jay, with John Jackson, and got on my snowmobile, and, and it was a bluebird powder, and just stepped out my camera. I'm like, I'm back. 
That's so <laughs> sick. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, in that roster, like even getting those two locked in had to, like you said, it felt good. I mean, that those two alone could hold down a, like a short film, you know, from March in a good season. And then just adding to it with that roster, like having that confidence there, like all those names you named are all people that I know whether I know them or not as people that are going to produce, if they commit to something, whether they have no time or all the time. Right. And so that's sick, like nice organization. And I mean, I think people come to you because of what you showed them in the past. So it's good. Yeah. Thanks. I'm stoked. Yeah. The Roth, you know, it's all about the athletes at the end of the day, for sure. It's all about the athletes, the cinematographers and the editors, really. That's what I think a good snowboard movie comes down to without those three, you got nothing. And, you know, anytime you point a camera at Danny Davis or John Jackson, you're going to probably get gold, hmm. whether it's a trick or a slash or a line or, or even just goofing around in the parking lot, you're going to get something. Who's editing it? Most people know him as Roto. He was, he's a great editor. Um, he was on the free ride tour as a snowboarder. He's a good Sick. snowboarder. He knows, he knows how to ride. He knows what good snowboarding is. Yeah, thanks, respect. Yeah, Roto. He knows the difference between a backside seven and switchback seven, so... It matters. Yeah. It matters. Yeah. yeah. It does. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's cool. You guys are doing 60 stop tour. That is legendary. Uh, and excited to, to see that and know that, you know, snowboarding's alive and well. It's so good for the culture, for people to come out and go to those premieres and all that. So, uh, but, you know, we have so much to talk about with your 30, I mean, it's over 30 years, right? I made my first snowboard movie in 1989. Mm-hmm. So Totally Bored was my, my first movie. And then I worked for Fall Line Films for two years and then teamed up with Mac Dog and made TB2. Legendary. Well, let's, let's even run it back before, before that, too, because you're SoCal kid. Uh, and I know you grew up surfing and even climbing and things like that. But I wanna, I'm curious, you know, when did you first pick up a camera and realize this is your, your calling? Well, a film camera or a, or a still camera? Maybe both. Maybe both. Well, um, when I was in seventh grade, my father gave me one of his old cameras. He had a Minolta. Mm-hmm. And we had a dark room in our garage. And he asked me if I wanted to try photography. Handed me a camera, put a roll of black and white film in it. And he said, like, go out and shoot some photos. See if you like it. And I remember one of the first photos I took was a drinking fountain. <laughs> it was pretty simple. I just turned a drinking fountain on and let go of the handle and snapped a photo at one five hundredth just to fast shutter speed and froze the water. And I looked, I remember getting that picture and seeing the water frozen. I'm like, that's so cool. Just kind of started there. I just started shooting photos of my friends at school um, in Solana Beach. I went to Earl Warren uh, Junior High, started shooting photos of my friends. I was friends with Aaron Astorga. I would shoot him skateboarding and we'd go surfing down at Seaside where I grew up surfing. I'd take some surf photos and just kind of, it was all about the dark room though. The dark room in the garage would be take photos and after school I'd just go into the dark room and print. And I got totally stoked on printing photos. And then in eighth grade, we had a photography class at Earl Warren Junior High. And I just I I got an A in the class. I was still just like the star student. So I was totally pumped on that. And that that was the kind of the photography that's how it led photography is what got me started into into filmmaking actually. So after eighth grade Ninth grade came along, and my brother and I started getting in a lot of trouble in school. Bad grades, partying, this and that and the other. My dad moved us up to Lake Tahoe to get, a, to get out of SoCal. And my, I went up there, and I ended up staying about six months and not liking Tahoe. And I went back to San Diego and got a job as a dishwasher in a restaurant. And then um, things kind of progressed, stayed down there, got in some more trouble, had this epiphany after this one big episode of getting in trouble and um, went back to Tahoe, talked to my dad and said, hey, I want to go back to Southern California and go to school for photography at a junior college. And at that point, my, I, so my dad said yes. I went back and I would have been in 11th grade at that point. I got emancipated. Mm. So when you're a minor, you basically get, you're 18 years old. When you get emancipated, you're 16, but you're legally, you guess you get signed off. My dad had to go to the superior court with me and I got signed off, went to, went to school. And, um, during that time, my brother started snowboarding and rock climbing. And, um, 
I was going to school for photography at, in Southern Cal, and Dave was becoming a professional snowboarder and a rock climber. He, had, he knew Tom Bird and Kidwell and Palmer, and s- snowboarding was just starting to get. Sorry, yeah. I interrupt, but I had uh, no, it's okay. So snowboarding was just starting to go along then, and and um, I'm I'm going to school for photography, and I'm going to Palomar College in SoCal, and Dave comes down to Joshua Tree to go climbing, and he's like, "Hey, Mike, I'm going down to Joshua Tree to go climbing." For the weekend, you want to cruise out and do some climbing and take some photos? I'm like, sure, that sounds good. So I go out there, bring my camera, go climbing. I'm like, this is super cool. Like I could, I try rock climbing. I'm loving it. And I'm loving f- shooting photos out in the desert and draw a tree, cruising around. I'm like, this is dope. Like this landscape, you're just walking around. It's so pretty taking photos. And I'm going back on Sunday night and I ask my brother, I go, dude, how long, how long are you guys staying here for? And he's like, oh, a couple months. I'm like, months? I'm like, where are you living? He's like, right there in the tent. Um, and then right then, like a light bulb went off in my head. I'm just like, you get to live in a tent and you, whatever, you bring your car down here and spend two months not working and rock climbing every day. And right then I'm like, this is my life. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm going to make this happen. So I kind of just, at that point, photography and rock climbing were going together. And then, then that led, when I got out of college and went to Breckenridge, and got a job as a busboy in a restaurant, met uh, Sean Farmer, Nick Parada, Andy Hetzel. Wow. Started shooting fo- more and more photos, got some photos in the first issue of Snowboarder Magazine. And that kind of just, that again was just all part of my brother getting me into snowboarding and rock climbing and just wanting to live this lifestyle of shooting photos and cruising around. The end of that season, I met this guy, Pat Solomon, and he asked, me do you want to make a snowboard movie i'm like a snowboard movie i i'm a photographer i don't know how to film and he's like let's i went to school for uh i'm a you know i went to school in la for film production you you got you shoot you film it's just like photography it's it's a it's a film camera it's f stops it's focus it's the same thing so that next year we made totally bored we we dove in with sean farmer nick parada my brother were the main stars and that next winter we based out of tahoe and made totally bored so that's kind of how I got into it. Incredible. Incredible. First question I have is what film camera for photos were you shooting on? Oh, I was using a Nikon. Yeah. Nikon F3. Cool. Yeah. Amazing. And then you guys were shooting 16 millimeter for Totally Board, right? Yeah, for Totally Board. Yeah, we're using Airy S's. Amazing. SBs, yeah. You know, thinking about that, like right in the intro of Totally Board, you have, I think it's Farmer Jump and Baker Road Gap. Yeah. And you're, you know, thinking about that, it's 1989, give or take-ish, right? And it's like, at the time, snowboarding didn't have a bar set, right? Everything you guys were doing was maybe potentially for the first time. Uh, I I guess it would be interesting to hear you talk about how you guys were just kind of, everywhere you went, you were pioneering. Everywhere you went was like first descents around that time, right? Yeah, there was no real, yeah, there was no bar set. We were just... Going, I think that was the first time the Mount Baker Road Gap had ever been hit. We were just like, let's jump. Farmer's like, I'm going to jump the road. And we, we looks like you could jump it right there. And we just go, oh, there's an in-run. Oh, you got to duck this one tree branch and build a wedge here and go over it. And that was probably the big one of the bigger things that he hit that year. But yeah, it, was, it all kind of just started at Mount Baker and even Squaw Valley, which is now Palisades, and even the backcountry stuff. It was just cruising around. Oh, well, let's jump off this little rock or hit this little hip. It wasn't, there was no, you've got to build this big gap and do this big trick. It was just, oh, I'll go just spin a, go do a front side three off that thing. It'll make the mm. flick. You know, go do a butter or whatever. It wasn't, there was no, we were just cruising around shredding and filming it really. Just looking around just past the rope or just in like on the mountain. Cause uh, yeah. I mean, Palisades is an insane, it's insane terrain if it's not blown out, right? Like if you have just the mountain itself in fresh tracks, like you can film your season there. Oh yeah. And so much of the earlier stuff was, yeah, it was so much of it was inbounds right in the ski area, you know, and then them totally bored with farmer, the mountain mountain maker. Um, a lot of that was, is it chair one? And then there you go up the one on the backside, they left that one chair closed for us all day and they were doing, mm-hmm. you know, Abbey control and we got the whole day to ourselves with just on a chairlift, which would probably never happen today. You'd probably get, you know, 
who knows what people would do to you. Mm-hmm. I, well, know. <laughs> I happen to, uh, going back to rock climbing, I happen to have a guest question from none other than the legend himself, Kevin Jones. Here we mm. go. Spike. Spike, it's KJ. Uh, guest question for you. True or false? You were a pro rock climber for a bad boy club. Part B of the question is, there's a boulder problem you were doing in an old Perlman video. Uh, was your ball sack actually hanging out of those shorts? <laughs> <laughs> KJ. KJ. I mean, I, I don't know if I was, I guess I was like semi-professional rock climber. I wouldn't say I was one of the you know top pros. But yeah, we were spon- my brother and I were sponsored by Bad Boy Club back in the day. And I used to make climbing films. Yeah, I made these movies, Masters of Stone. And they're kind of like standard films with the snowboard movies. They were kind of the fir- some of the first rock climbing videos cut with like heavy metal music and just core rock cl- then the be- well, I got to shoot with the best rock climbers in the world. And I did this one scene. There's this boulder. It's kind of, it's a tall boulder. It's probably 35 feet or something. It's pretty tall, 30. And there's this climb up it. It's really overhanging that my brother and I were the first people to climb it and I did it was I climbed without a rope and bouldered it and I didn't use my feet I just kind of like basically just climbed this with just my hands and I had these like funny bad boy club shorts on but my balls weren't hanging out they had had like (laughs) underwear is in the shorts but it's a pretty funny clip I have a mullet and uh I'm doing these you know I'm basically climbing with no feet just up this hands Mm -hmm. on this overhanging 12 plus boulder problem and, and Bad Boy Club was the cartoon character, right? Yeah, it was like Bad Boy Club. Yeah, it was guy, li- like, life's, life's a Beach. Yep. And I was friends with all those guys, you know, Beaver, Theodosakis, and Jamie Mouseberg, super well-known, you know, yep. snowboard and skate cinematographer. And um, they had the Life's a Beach bus. Brad Gerlock was sponsored by them. They were all my homies. I grew up in SoCal, and it was all like, I knew all those guys, and Bad Boy Club was, a, you know, part of Life's a Beach. And mm-hmm. they're like, oh, you guys want to get sponsored for rock climbing? And wear this day glow stuff with skulls on it. Heck and yeah. so back then, yeah, Iridium Oakley's and day glow skull pants. And we thought we were like the coolest dudes ever. You were. Yeah. You actually were. You actually I mean, were. bad boy club, like that's, that's respect. I actually <laughs> could, would like to run some of that merch right now. That's a hundred. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's fire. It'd be a dope Halloween costume. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. The mullet and the year round. Yeah. So go, going back to climbing, I think maybe talking to Downing, he was saying that, there, there's a lot of parallels in the sense that you guys would be up in the mountains looking for rocks to climb on in the summer and then realizing that when they filled them with snow, it could be potentially good for snowboarding. Is it, is that correct? Yeah. The same areas that we rock climb is a lot of the same places that we snowboard. And Dave and I, we, my brother and I, we've always been into exploring, just whether it's exploring the backcountry for snowboarding or exploring new rock climbs where people haven't climbed. And we're always hiking, trying to hike further and go deeper and go way out there. Yeah, and a lot of those rock faces in Tahoe, they're, they're you know, 200-foot cliff that you climb on. Maybe there's some, like, bushes next to it in a super steep slope that you wouldn't necessarily rock, rock climb right there. But that's right where the snow fills in. There's, like, these perfect steep spines. You go there in February, and it's a perfect snowboard run. So it's a lot of the Tahoe, the same exact areas you're climbing, you're basically snowboarding right next to it a few months later. It's got to give you a good feel when you can kind of attach yourself to the rock when you're riding over it in snow. I mean, does that apply a different connection to kind of that space for you? It's, I mean, definitely. Yeah. I mean, it's just fun to be out there in that same zone, working the same things and think, oh, we were just here in September climbing this stuff. And then, you know, my brother used to, you know, he was always into riding the steeps and he would literally snowboard this one thing out in Donner. He like literally snowboarded down this like rock climb. It's basically like this 150 foot thing on grouse slab and this, mm-hmm. you know, get a wet storm and the snow sticks to it. And it's, it's like some, enough. it's like a bolted five, seven face climb that you climb in the summer. And it's literally the snow sticks to it and you can ride right down it on certain years. That actually means nothing to me, but <laughs> yeah. you're snowboarding down. Gnarly. Yeah. You're snowboarding 150 down a rock climb. feet. I understood. <laughs> yeah. You're snowboarding down a rock climb basically. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's amazing. Cool Cause you're familiar yeah. with the, the zone too. Yeah. You're like, Oh yeah, we're here in the summer. Yeah, that's rad. So, okay, obviously TB1 comes out. It's, I mean, it's a classic, iconic snowboard video uh, where you basically just like, we got something here. Let's keep running it up. I wasn't even really, kind of, but I was never really thinking that far ahead. We made the movie and it kind of 
there was no really any distribution for it. Like there was mid, surf video network back in the day would sell videos and there was a, no one at the snowboard shops, there was even just a few snowboard shops even getting going in the surf shops, they would, they would buy the video, but not many of them. So the video financially kind of just flopped. There was like no money in it. There was no, you, have the, you tell, you call surf shop and hey, you guys want to sell a snowboard video, like a snowboard video. What are you talking about? Like, so these are VHS. You VHS actually is, like, made a certain amount of them, had boxes of them, you were just trying to unload, basically. I was just selling them to my friends, whatever, trying to unload to make a little bit of money back. Yeah, and it just was, there was no distribution for it. We got we got picked up by this company, GRB, Gary Benz Entertainment, and they did some TV distribution for us, but financially it wasn't going anywhere. Hmm. So I started working for Fall Line Films, because they had made Western Front, and they they were in it already, and, they, and I knew Jerry and Artie, and my brother was in their movies, and, you know, a lot of the writers were already in there, Damian, Sammer, Damian Sanders, Chris Roach, you know, some of the raddest snowboarders around back then. And um, so they, I got a job working for them filming Critical Condition and Riders in the Storm. I'm like, well, if I can't make my own movie, if I don't have the means to produce my own film, I'll just hone my skills as a filmmaker shooting for Fall Line. And they had a budget. They sent me up to Whistler with my brother and – um, I got to shoot with, you know, a lot of rad riders too. So it was great just shooting for fall line. And those guys were at that time, they were the top guys. They were, they were the Mac dog productions of the early days. Mm -hmm. There was fall line films was it. And so when critical condition came out and you're a part of that, did snowboarding feel like it was really starting to get some, some life breathed into it where it was like, damn, this, this is going, we got something here. Let's keep running with it. Definitely. It was yeah. really alive and well. Yeah, it was alive and well. And I remember being at the premiere, I think it was in Reno, I want to say. And there was a lot of people in the theater. Jerry and Artie went up there and said a little thank you for everyone coming. And the lights went down. And, you know, it was it was feeling like it was something. Yeah, I mean, Doug Palladini from Snowboarder Magazine, he, he ran Snowboard at the time. Jerry and Artie are yeah. the fall lane film founders, founders. and they, and yeah, and, and then, yeah. And, and Doug was running snowboarder and he, he was, they, they were teaming up and putting ads in the snowboarder mag and d the snowboarder was promoting the movie and there was a little theatrical showings going around. It definitely felt like filmmaking was becoming a thing, like snowboard filmmaking was becoming like a thing, you know? And then Jerry and Artie, they started as they worked at Squaw back then, which is not Palisades. They were, they would work. They worked at the top of the chairlift. Hey, we're the guys that video you. You when you want us, we'll film you skiing down the hill. Yes. And they were those dudes that like they were just like a couple of video nerds making well, I don't know minimum wage probably. And then they turned. They had a little place called Snow Motion, and they had a little studio at Squaw above um, this one little building, and they started shooting Western Front. They started shooting in the spring, the first year that it was allowed at Squaw on a trial basis. And that's when they made Western Front, and then they made Snowboarders in Exile, Critical Condition, Riders in the Storm. Yeah, and at that point, it really, right after Riders in the Storm, I'd say, it really started, a lot of momentum started becoming into snowboard filmmaking, you know. That, but, that skate tie, too, there with Cardiel, like, totally. really kind of changing the game on a snowboard as well. And then, so yeah, it drew a, a different crowd, I think, at that time. And yes. that was, it gave me chills listening mm -hmm. to that. Like, that's... Man, that's that's an era. Yeah, you got Cardiel, you had Chris Roach, Monty Roach, Noah Selaznick, you know Damian Sanders, but he was a little bit of a different style. He would go like bigger off maybe cliffs and had the hard boots, so it was like this little bit. But he was gnarly at freestyle too. I mean, gnarly. But a lot of the skate influenced snowboarding was born in Tahoe at Donner Summit, mm -hmm. right there. Mm -hmm. I mean. So dope. Yeah, and that was, you know, Donner Ski Ranch being one of the first ski areas to allow snowboarding. And a lot of the stuff, the backcountry is so accessible right there. You could park your car right by Donner Ski Ranch and just walk out, and there's hits and, you know, features everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that's where it kind of started with, with yeah, with, with Kidwell, Palm, all those guys. They just hiking around the backcountry around there, and Fall Line was kind of at the, the forefront of that, capturing it and really blowing it up to the next level, I would say. You could feel it walking around that space the first time dogger ever took me there and starting to move around like it it was weird because you recognize things even if they filled in different and it it felt like a different kind of there was something there was like a hollowed ground there that it, it was unique for sure that that summit yeah 
It's, it's still a, is. It still is. All right, we're going to take a quick break and talk to you guys about one of our sponsors, Bubs Naturals. Now, Bubs Naturals supports snowboarding. So if you're going to buy an electrolyte mix, might as well buy it from a company that supports snowboarding. Uh, they have 2,000 milligrams of electrolytes in each one of these little packets. They're vegan, no added sugar. That's really important. No added sugar. Most of these other ones are packed full of sugar. Soy-free, non-GMO, gluten-free. It's no artificial colors, flavors, or preservatives. Their hydrate or die hydration packs are amazing. It's a product I actually use every single day, and I'm not bullshitting. So um, if you're interested in getting some hydration packs, I recommend the lemon flavor. That's my favorite. They're also known for their collagen. That's kind of their staple product. Jeremy Jones mentions how he always uses it to come back from injuries. Good for your skin, good for your nails. So if you're interested in getting some electrolyte mix, some collagen, check out bubsnaturals.com and use promo code BOMBHOLE at checkout for 20% off. Again, bubsnaturals.com, promo code BOMBHOLE, 20% off. Okay, we're going to do some basic house cleaning, talk to you guys about some bomb hole stuff. Uh, first things first, we just released Seb Picard's project on our channel. He is a French-Canadian street destroyer. Hits some great spots with impeccable style. It's got that Northeast Canadian vibe. Uh, really cool spot. So check out his project called Four on our YouTube channel. And we're also releasing Man Boy's Tango Echo Chamber on our YouTube channel coming out next week. So those will be some fun videos to watch. Uh, we appreciate those guys uh, hosting them on our channel. And huge news. We have our most legitimate looking product we've ever created. It's called The Brick. It's a three pack of smelling salts. You save some money. Everybody knows that smelling salts are the most performance enhancing drug, allegedly, I should say, for legal purposes on the planet. So uh, if you want to get some salts, check out The Brick. Great gift for a friend. And then uh, what else? I got a new beanie. I'm wearing it right now. We just came out with these Bad Larrys, um, kind of checkered prints. So that's basically it for bomb hole stuff. Uh, we'll get back to the show, but we appreciate you guys. Thanks for listening. I'd love to hear you talk about, because we here, we're more in like the Rocky Mountains, a little bit of a different snowpack, and you are the pioneer of pretty much Tahoe region in general. You know, Kevin Jones just wouldn't, you know, stop kind of reiterating like any film crew that's been to Tahoe, like hatchets have kind of pioneered most of the zones out there and everything. So I'd love to hear you elaborate on like what makes that zone special. Well, so much of it is, um, it's accessibility is one thing. It's so much stuff is right there. It's the features like back to the rock climbing. There's so much rocks and boulders and just, there's so many features when the snow fills in, there's all these, perfect snowboarding features everywhere and also i'd say the maritime snowpack is is a you know compared to continental snowpack maritime snowpack is generally i don't like using the word safer but it is a little more user friendly you're going to have less avalanches there and you know you wait 24 hours after a storm and you can usually go just about anywhere with common sense you know stay away from cornices and terrain traps and wind loading and obvious stuff that is a totally obvious, I think, as far as anyone that knows anything about avalanches. You don't need a big skill set to go out there and have a good time, um, if, you know, as long as you're careful. And I just think it's a kind of a combination of all that, the accessibility, the avalanche conditions, and the terrain, and stuff being so roadside. A lot of this stuff is roadside. I mean, more and more now with snowmobiles, People are snowmobiling deeper and they're split boarding now where people are going on bigger adventures. But yeah, back then it was so roadside. You had Donner Summit, Mount Rose. You just pull your car off the side of the road and they didn't allow snowboards everywhere. We were like, you know, we were the, we were getting laughed at, blocked at. You can't go on the hill. You're not allowed here. So we, where do we go? We'll go to Donner because you can just park your car and walk right up. Go ahead. I got a question on, I mean, you mentioned common sense and I'm just in like, how how can one get common sense? Because looking at the mountain and and seeing a cornice, on like even in common sense, it seems that it's not that common for someone to recognize that as a threat. They'll just move right under it because more than anything, it's almost like a feature that draws them in because they're like, look at this cool thing that I could kind of park under, and it's sort of like a wave. And I, like that seems to be more of the processing of someone looking at the backcountry. So how would you like suggest someone 
even learns to identify common sense in the backcountry because I think it is lost. I think common sense is and and also one of the easiest things for us to forget and not, and not use. Yeah, I, first for me, g- go out with someone that's more experienced than you. Learn from a mentor, whether it's a ski patrol or your bro that's been doing it for ten years. Like, go out with someone that knows way more than you do. And then just always think on your feet and don't get drawn in. Like, you, you need to go out and learn the basics. Like I said, the cornice, a terrain trap, wind loading, obvious hazards. You can go to av- – you should take an avalanche class for sure. But you should also use your brain every time you go out there, you know, and, and really remember you – know, it's like the hungry hippo thing. I see it more and more now. Everyone just rushes out there. It snows five feet, and everyone just goes right out the gate. Mm-hmm. They don't just wait a day, or they don't give it a day. Let it sit a day, right inside the resort for a day, and shred that up until it, you know, till it's a, till it's all chewed up, and then go in the backcountry. And then, yeah, and then always listen. You know, call, go to your local avalanche forecast. What are they? What are they saying the conditions are like? And like, and then always think on your feet because you get drawn in. You get out there and you get sucked into like. Oh, look at that f- spine or that cornice. Mm-hmm. I want to, I want to go off it, and you have this f- false sense of security, and you get the adrenaline going, and you just want to go because maybe someone else already is. But if someone else is maybe I don't say dumb enough to go ahead of you when they shouldn't be, let them go and live to ride another day, and just mm-hmm. hang out and just take take a chill pill and just give it a day, and and use and you know, and you'll you know you'll. I think that goes a long way just to hit the brakes sometimes and ask yourself, what is it smart what I'm doing? And there's always obviously going to be that element of risk. You never know. Sure. But you can eliminate so much of the risk by just using your head. Yeah, common sense. I love that. Uh, the make sure someone is better than you. Like if you're heading out for the first time and you don't have someone far more experienced than you with you, you're doing it wrong already. Even if you took an avalanche course, in my opinion, I, agree. I love that. I think that's an awesome suggestion. And then Thank go, you. going back to just those early days, I'm so curious because you guys are dropping in your riding zones for the first time. Are you guys wearing beacons? Do you guys know about this at this <laughs> point in 1990 or whatever it is? <laughs> Trick question. Is yeah. That? No, we had beacons. Yeah, we had beacons and we had shovels and probes. And Tom Burt was our mentor. Got it. Okay. Mm, that makes I mean, sense. it was all, it basically yeah. all came to Tom Burt. Yep is what it came down to. He, he basically taught us everything. And we were, we were serious about safety. We, we would practice. We had our beacons. We would always do beacon practices and avalanche rescue. This is before you could go lo- online, and I don't think there was even much of a protocol for how to rescue somebody. We would have our own rescue scenarios and go put someone in charge. You're going to be this far apart if someone gets buried. We're going to do a, a beacon search like this. Now this is all more... I want to say common knowledge, but you can look it up. There's all these like rescue scenarios you go through that people that everyone should know. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we we had those back then, and we used them. And we were sm- and a lot of it back to Tahoe. We lived in Tahoe, maritime snowpack. Wait 24 hours, unless you walk out on a 50 foot overhanging cornice above a creek bed, you're probably going to come home in one piece. You know, mm-hmm. most likely. Not to say that stuff doesn't happen, but most of it happens during the storm, or shortly after that. Mm. Mm-hmm. Killer. Well, going to uh, TB... So TB2, you break off from FLF, right, which was monumental. I, we probably didn't do the FLF enough justice uh, of how monumental those videos were. Actually, let me actually rewind it real quick. Who blew you away the most filming for uh, FLF years? I mean, there it's hard... I'm going to say Damian Sanders. Yeah. Just, mm. I mean, I can go on and start mentioning more names because there are a lot of guys, and Damian's style was definitely not like a skate style. like what. But he just – it It was just because he went so big, and it was the Iridium Oakley's, the hard – he could tweak so gnarly in those hard boots. And he was Unreal. just – Yeah. Back then, he was kind of the king. He just would, went bigger and tweaked gnarly airs and hard boots and the crazy haircut and the Iridium Oakley's, and he was just kind of the man. When you're doing it right like that and everyone is a fan of everything that they think they don't like, you know you're just doing your thing and you're doing it proper. I think that is a lot of respect to Damien in that because yeah. he stood his own ground and it was respected because <laughs> you can't tweak like that in hard boots. Yeah. 
it was just, and I actually, I, it's just crazy. I mean, I learned from those guys from, you know, Jim Zeller, Tom Burt, my brother, and I was wearing hard boots. And Selaznik's like, Spike, dude, we got to get off you those hard, we got to get off those hard boots, dude. Like, I'm like, well, they got so much support and they feel good. And he's like, dude. Spike, did you say? Yeah, what's my nickname? So Salaz talked me out of the hard boots one day on KT. And he, I, he took a knee with you at an intervention? He intervened. Hard boot he, intervention? Hard boot intervention. Hard boot intervention on KT. And the next day I put soft boots on and took about a half a run to get used to it. And I'm like, I'm never riding hard shells again. Wow. Yeah. And was that like Sorrell's soft boots? And they were they were basically Sorrell, little beefed up Sorrell's. I was, some, I was maybe riding some of the first Burton boots. Mm. They had just like that kind of... One liner, yeah. No, not neoprene, but it was like that one rubber liner and super soft. Yeah, it was yeah. like a little half pipe boot or something. Yeah, yeah. I remember so, getting in the in the soft shells though and just laughing at myself, going, "What was I thinking?" I'm wearing <laughs> Daglo lime green Daglo outfit with Koflak hard shells with a 14 inch stance, totally crazy. Just with it, it just you know, you remember those old Excel. Avalanche boards with a square tail mm-hmm. oh, yeah. and a 180 Excel with a square tail and Damien. Look at what Damien did on that thing. Mm-hmm. Like, ask yourself. Didn't bend either. Yeah. Just a plank. You know, the uh, last year, maybe a couple years ago, I, I rented skis and hiked up Grizzly <laughs> Gulch. And I can't even believe people walk around in those fucking things, those boots. I know, they're crazy. Those bear traps. Are, they're like cinder blocks on your feet that just like... They, and they post hole way more worse than snowboard boots and everything. They're the, they're the worst. Brad Holmes is a one of the, you know ex pro mogul skier, good friend of mine. He shot a bunch of the snowboard movie this year, and he's always like these ski boots. He's out in the backcountry, and these ski boots. I'm like, dude, just put some snowboard boots on, and it's all solved. <laughs> Problem solved, <laughs> yeah. right there. Yeah. Problem solved. So what what prompted uh, you breaking off and and starting TB2 and Standard Films and all that? Well, I've always been pretty independent and driven. And um, I asked Jerry uh, Dugan from Fall Line, hey, after Riders in the Storm came out, can, can I edit? Can I help produce? Can I help pick some music? Can I do anything else besides shoot? And he's like, Mike, you're pretty much only going to ever be a filmer. Hmm. And he was kind of a little bit condescending, being nice, but a little bit condescending at the same time. And that just lit a fire under my ass. I'm like, dude, I've... I just felt to myself, I know I can edit. I know I can more. produce. I've, I, can, I can do more than this. And one day at Squaw, Sionia, Dave Sionia was half joking around with my brother and I. I think I said something I was venting about Jerry because the season was coming up. Where was the end of the season or it was the beginning of the season? I think it was early December. And we were maybe it was like the first day Squaw opened or something. And Sionia was like, you should just team up with Mac Dog and make, uh, make your own movie. Screw Fall Line. Wow, that's kind of a damn good idea. And I talked to my brother, and we knew Mac Dog because my brother had been in some Mac Dog movies. He'd been in the Hard, the Hungry, and the Homeless, and some other Mac Dog movies. And called Mac Dog up and, dude, you want to make a snowboard movie together? And Dogger's like, yeah, let's do it. So we met. So we just, yeah, I broke off with Fall Line and teamed up with Dogger. And Dogger came up with the name Standard Films. And we kind of had a game plan let's make a movie that's half free ride and half freestyle. And my brother and I would kind of spearhead the, the free ride, kind of backcountry powder stuff. And Dogger would spearhead the freestyle and make a really athlete-driven movie. No narration, not much of a travel log, just like rider parts. And although we did do like an Alaska part in that movie and stuff like that, but that's kind of how the – it's how it, that's how it came to be with Dogger. And we had a great winner that year. And, yeah, we made TB2. Mm-hmm. I happen to have a guest question from none other than the legendary Mac Dog. Here we go. What up, Bomb Holt? And what up, Mike Hatchet? It's your old buddy Mike McIntyre here. And I would really appreciate hearing a story that not many people know about and I think would be fascinating in regards to our old Aeroflex 16 millimeter cameras that we used to use and how your dad invented a power source for us that not only would run at the camera specs, but would also double what was actually the camera was capable of, shooting twice as slow as we normally could, which was a distinct advantage and a huge advancement in cinematography. That would be amazing. All right, buddy. Hope you're doing good. That's so cool. Um, Yeah, so my dad, um, he... 
Jerry Dugan from Fallline first was he had a Makita battery and he would just wire it as a power source, but it was pretty crude. And it was just one battery. And one time I actually threw it on my counter after filming one day and it caught fire and almost burnt my house down because the wire, it wasn't that, didn't have a case around it or anything like that. And it, I put the metal, touched the metal on the thing, whatever, and it just basically caught fire. It was crazy. But my dad was a, an electrical engineer from SC. Uh, he graduated from SC. He was a very smart person. And um, he just loved to play around with stuff. And he was t- always backed what Dave and I did, even though we were kind of troublemakers in our younger days. He always was back in the snowboarding and all that. And when we got into the to making films, I told him that these battery belts were very, they were bulky and they'd only run 24 frames. You could maybe go to 32 frames if you were lucky, which is a little bit above real time, not slow motion. And I showed my dad this one battery that Dugan had uh, wired up. And my dad made a schematic. He just looked at his, oh, really? Okay. He took two battery, two Makita batteries, wired them together, and then put like a housing around it, all perfect, and then had an on-off switch. And then what we would do is you would, you would flick this one switch. It would be low or high. So if you're on low, it's 24 frames. And then if you flick it on high, it would engage both batteries together, and it would instantly have 48 frames, which is slow motion. Dang. And you could even go to 80 frames because you, you could crank on the battery. You could crank, but that would give you some frame jitter sometimes. So it would kind of pull the film out of the gate. But you could go to 64 frames, no problem. You can go 32 frames, which is a little bit slow motion, but not really. And then you hit the double thing, and it would go 64 frames. And it was all, and the thing was, you know, super small, eight inches by four inches. And everyone ended up using them. He made them for Mac Dog. He made them for all the ski movie guys, MSP. He made them for TGR. He, made, he basically, he just would do them for free for everybody. You buy the parts. He would say, you guys buy the parts, and I'll wire them for you. So my dad ended up wiring these Makita batteries for pretty much everybody. No way. The yeah. power of the industry. And, right and there. then just to, you know, highlight the fact that also just 16 millimeters normally shot 24 frames a second is what the usually looks like. You're like pretty much normal speed. And then you have all of a sudden you have slow-mo 16 millimeter and that's that was monumental for snowboard filmmaking. Right? It was a big thing. Yeah, because it was really hard to get 48 frames out of a normal battery pack and you'd have to rig something up or have a super just more than you could carry with you. So yeah, it was just, it would all of a sudden allowed you to have slow motion and you could stick it all in your backpack. You just had this like super small setup. So that, that's a really cool question from Dogger. And that was, yeah, my dad was, he was pumped to make all the batteries for everybody. Yeah. Downing mentioned a story about you guys were at Brighton. Um, maybe you're riding with Johan and Johan, was riding maybe it was like the Hebert cliff or something like that but he did something really sick and he said that your camera caught on fire uh, maybe it was my battery probably yeah yeah my battery that was in the yeah those things would short out if you got the wires touching something and that was even after my dad had made the the thing I mean the things definitely you couldn't take airport security yeah there weren't they were sometimes pretty hard to get through security it's like nowadays you'd never be able to do it be it like, looks like a bomb basically it right? looks it like looks a bomb, like a bomb. <laughs> yeah. i took it through the miami airport one time and i'm like dude it's just a, i tell him the guy i was like it's just a i take these through all these airports it's just a, it just runs my camera and he's like well you haven't been through the miami airport this guy and I'm, but I, I ended up plugging it into showing him and but yeah i mean they literally could catch fire um <laughs> So sketchy. <laughs> That's insane. Yeah. Cool. So you Dogger team up, uh, and then Dogger he brought along Slaznik with him, right? Yeah, he did definitely. Well, he I knew Noah because I shot him with Fall Line films. Yep. so I kind of already knew him. And Noah and I were already friends, but he he brought Noah with him, and you know Jamie Lynn, Terry Hawkinson, Daniel Frank. Wow. Yeah. Todd Schloss or Dave. I mean, the, li- the list goes on, but those guys were more, and they were in TB3. But yeah, Dogger brought a really heavy hitting cast with him. And I got to work with all those guys too, which is so cool because I'm going to shoot the freestyle. I mean, he says, I'm going to shoot the freestyle and I'm going to shoot the backcountry. But I also got to work with, you know, I shot probably half of Terrier's part in TB2 and got to, you know, meet all those guys and work with them. So that was really cool. I mean, Dogger brought a very heavy hitting cast to the table. What was the first year you went to Alaska? Uh, first year I went, um, I went the year before TB2, so it would have been the 91. It was the year of the first World Extreme Snowboard Championships. Mm. Now I was working for Fall Line Films as a cinematographer that year. That was the first year I went. I just shot the contest, and maybe one day after one quick little day in the backcountry, 
And then we went back the next year would be the, sp- the spring of 93 would be when we were making TB2. That was my first like real year in Alaska having the heli. I wouldn't say private, but there was probably only 20 people in Valdez the whole year that year. And we were flying with Chet Simmons. The, he had the, you know, the Vietnam vet and he had this, the jet ranger there. We were staying up at the Santa Lodge, which is now all rebuilt. It was basically a shack back then. And we were sleeping on these ratty old cots behind the kitchen. And some people were sleeping in these Atco trailers out. And it was a full, we were dirtbagging it big time. And I think there was maybe, it was Slaznik, Tom Burt, my brother, Rocket Reeves was there at the end. Tex was there. Craig Kelly was there at the end. And then there was probably eight skiers maybe that were there. And we were all kind of sharing the heli. Mm Mm-hmm. We were the only ones there. And you guys you know. shooting Barbie and out of the heli? Yeah, we were shooting and Barbie and out of the heli. And that, that was fun for me because I had watched some Warren Miller movies and some Greg Stump movies that were big. Influ- Greg Stump especially was a huge influence watching his ski movies like Blizzard of Oz. And, but they were in like License of Thrill. But a lot of the stuff was really tight. Really slow motion, tight. All the, even they went to Alaska and they, everything was on slope and slow motion. I'm like, I want to show how big these mountains are. So that was like the first thing when I went up there for TB2. I want to do some um, big Barbie, you know, Barbie angles, which is basically Jerry and Artie came turned from fall line termed barbecue. barbecue. Basically, is, a, you could, is the filmer could set up a barbecue and shoot the riders risking their lives on some big face and the filmers just flipping burgers. So that's how Barbie angle originated was from Jerry and Artie. I never knew that. Yeah, that's how that originated. But I took the Barbie angle up to, to, to uh, Valdez saying, hey, I want to shoot Tom Burr and Noah, whatever, four turns down this face and then do a big wide pull and show how big these faces are. And then also no one was, I don't think barely anyone had shot from the heli at all. Like maybe rap films had done Meteorite with the doors off with Trevor, Trevor Peterson and Eric Peota for a ski movie. But no one had really done much shooting with the doors off. So that was another thing too. I'm going to put a wide angle on and just circle around the peak and just show how big these mountains are and show the sloughs coming down and really give it some scale. Because when you, when anyone that's ever been to Alaska will know when you're flying around those peaks, you just shit your pants. It's like, holy crap. Like when you're, it doesn't matter how many times you've been to Valdez or anywhere in Alaska. It's, it's a, you always get so pumped when you're flying up to some spines. It's like, oh my, this is like the best thing I've ever seen in my life. Start salivating for these spines you're going to ride down. And it's hard to, if you're on slope and it's all slow motion, it gives it no scale. You can't see the slough coming down. And now everyone just sees it. Now you, now it's just like, oh, I, there's a big spine. But back then, no one, there was no scale. There was, no, there was nothing to get, no cinematography to like gauge it against. Now everyone just shows it. You know, now we all have been through it and everyone's seen a fluted spine and a slough coming down. I love the the cinematography in uh, everything you just described. Like you go in there with these shots in mind and like to show the beauty and the size and not just this trick. Even inside your like trick format video with the TBs where it's just like rattling off tricks, you the cinematography is still there. And I think it's a, maybe a dying art to some extent nowadays. I mean, there's a lot of really good, I don't know, filmers out there that can get a shot, right? Yeah. A ton of them. And, and that is good. I just think that cinematography learn that you have and background that you have is so, I mean, it's what changed the game, but to, I guess to keep it going um, is it difficult? It is. It is difficult. Yeah. And it's also the equipment too. Like when you're shooting, everyone uses a red now and a lot of people use the Canon lenses with a red and you can't zoom in unless you buy a really expensive zoom. A lot of people don't have, you're kind of fixed with a Canon. you can't, it won't hold focus mm. all the way through. Mm-hmm. So when you, ha- in the old days, old days, Mm -hmm. (laughs) when you're shooting 16 millimeter, you had basically three lenses. You had a five, nine wide angle, a nine mil wide angle and a 12 to 120. That was your zoom lens. That's what I brought to Alaska. That's when you're wide angle to zoomed in. And when you zoom all the way in and focus, you can zoom all the way out and it stays sharp. Where a Canon lens, if you're using like a 70 to 200 or 
a 24 to 70, you can't really, it's a still photography lens. You can't zoom in on the still and then have it hold focus. And some people with these new reds, they're, they're getting, they have the cash. You can actually buy a cine lens that does hold focus. But there is this art when you, it's a little bit of a lost art. With six, when you're shooting 16 millimeter, you, I feel very engaged with the rider when I'm shooting. It's, mm. it's like, okay, he's going to go up to this jump. He's going to jump this 50, 60 foot gap, spin a seven and land. And I can be a little, I'm going to start wide. I can just visualize the shot in my head. I'm going to start wide. I'm going to push in. I'm not going to go too tight because I want to show the gap. And right when he goes off the lip, I'm going to be a certain focal length. I'm going to hang with him, land, and then go out of frame, let's say. just That's just one shot, for instance. But I feel like it's a little bit hard to do that with a red and some of the new cameras because of the way you're shackled by the lens selection you're mm -hmm. using. And you can post-production, yeah, you can zoom in a little. Yeah, film it wide, punch in, but punch it's not in. the same as a, as a zoom. A zoom gives you feeling. Like it gives zoom you feeling. gives you feeling. Like it's, yeah. 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 You connect with the rider mm -hmm. when you have a zoom and you feel like you're part of the experience. And I feel like that's something that's a little bit lost mm -hmm. with the new cameras. Mm -hmm. And you think that's mostly because of the cost of, of like converting it? Because throw those photo lenses on a red versus the expense of a cine lens on that red. Like that's really what's separating things right in yes. that in that and they're really heavy like mm. a 30 to 300 canon you, there, there's no way you are ip your back yeah you can't <laughs> walk around the backcountry that a 30 <laughs> to 300 canon but two years ago with four years ago i was in alaska for tgr on a ski movie and they rented me a 30 to 300 canon with a microforce and i was so stoked mm -hmm. i mean because you can sit there and zoom in and zoom out on the barbie angles all with like your finger and you can ex you can control the speed of the zoom and you can get a little more cine then and also when you're using film you're you only have one roll of film it's three minutes long it's a hundred foot daylight load every shot counts mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to rattle off 20 yeah. portraits of somebody taking a sip of water yep. and then pick the best one all right we're going to take a quick break and talk to you guys about our sponsor hippies now this is a chip company that supports a snowboard podcast so keep that in mind if you're buying some chips support companies that support snowboarding they also got tasty flavor packed chips i've been running the nacho vibes let me tell you something it's flavor country all day long they're packed full of flavor they're non-gmo and they're made with chickpeas so they're healthy they got some good protein in there and you can find them at your local grocery store whenever i'm in whole foods i always see them and you can also find them at hippies.com so use promo code bombhole all caps for 20 percent off your order at hippies.com you shoot it differently. I, I think yeah. that's there's definitely something to that. And one thing we got to get to the bottom of that's super interesting. I'm excited to talk about. Like nowadays, for reference, for people that don't know, if you're going to ride a line, whether it's in Utah, whether it's in Tahoe, whether it's in Alaska, when you're at the bottom, you're probably going to take a photo with your iPhone and you're going to look at it and you're going to say, oh, there's a tree halfway down. That's when you get to the top because it's a blind convex roll. You you might have a reference point, but you basically, when you go to these big mountains in Alaska, you need a reference of where you are, right? And back in the day, we didn't have, you guys didn't have iPhones. So um, I was talking to Downing and some people, and they were mentioning that you guys used Polaroids back in the day. Uh, are you the inventor of the Polaroid for the, the big mountain line? Possibly, maybe not myself, but I would say possibly, probably the standard films crew. And it might have been... Selaznik, uh, Victoria was big with the Polaroid. She'd always shoot. It was probably Victoria or Noah, one of those two. And, and one of our crew, Tom Burt, my brother, yeah, we would shoot. We basically would use Polaroids, yeah, for all the stuff. I, I mean, I have the old Polaroid of Super Spines from Noah still, the original Polaroid. And, um, yeah, we would use the Polaroid, look at it, and be like, oh, yeah, there's this chocolate chip, 10 turns down, and dive right into the gully when your slough's going there. You know, stuff like that. And you guys were using walkie-talkies back then? Oh, yeah. We're using radios, radios and Polaroids. Yeah. But definitely no cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> no go, no GoPros. Super interesting. Uh, thinking about, like, on the dash of the heli, Downing was saying on the dash of the heli, there'd just be a mountain of Polaroid photos that you'd be, like, thumbing through, right? Oh, yeah. There's this one thing. I, we called it the menu. <laughs> Trying to get it from Conway. He's one of our old guides. Um, he's got the... We... we would it's basically Polaroids of most of the Chugach, a lot of the Chugach, 
before it was explored or as it was getting explored with coordinates ri- written on the... Sorry, what's the Chugach? No That's in Valdez. That's the, uh, Valdez. the Chugach okay. Mountains. Got it, yep. So it's... Um, and it's like this... It's it's like literally like I call, I call it the menu. It's like going to the best restaurant in the world and ordering everything off... Anything you could imagine off the menu is, you know, pontoon, meteorite, the diamond, the wall... Whatever, you know, whatever, Sphinx, every run you can think of, and all the smaller runs, and they're all got the coordinates written on them in a Polaroid. I'd love to see that. Yeah, he's got it in his garage. I was trying to get him to dig it up. He's like, it's somewhere. They're faded. I'm like, dude, dig that thing up. I want to check it out. Mm -hmm. Because he would have it, and we'd just, we'd take photos and just, we'd write the coordinates, and oh, and this has ever been written, and take a photo, and then write the coordinates, and then go ski or snowboard it, because we would do a lot of stuff with Doug Coombs back then when he... When he was alive, when he founded Valdez Heli Ski Guides, and he was one of our major uh, persons we would explore with, and we yeah we just snap Polaroids and cruise around Valdez, and um, it was different back then too because we had bigger budgets. Like it wasn't there was only a few people in the entire mountain range, and we had I want to say fairly unlimited budgets. A private helicopter for thirty days, fly wherever the hell you want, and don't worry about how much it costs. Wow. Damn. Not anymore. N- now, yeah. going back to the, the what you're talking about, like these mountains, most of them hadn't been ridden, right? A lot of them had not been ridden. Some of them had been, and a lot of the stuff as you go deeper had not been ridden. And there was people that were definitely picking off the big ones, like the big main ones. But we, the deeper you go in certain zones, yeah, stuff had not, a lot of it had been, it probably been about 30% explored, I'd say, when we started going in there in, the, in between, you know, 93 and 2000 is when the, I'd say the bulk of the exploration went down 96 to like 99, I'd say. Were those mm-hmm. different trips? Like you, you'd go just explore? We, no, they, we, we would do one month every year in usually April, last week of March, or all, all of April or last week of March to, you know, last week of April. And we'd do a 30-day trip and it would just be a standard films trip and we'd have one private heli, two groups, and we had, you know, yeah, Tex, Tomber, Victoria, Selaznik, Johan, Downing, you know, the list, Nate Cole, the, the guys that we were bringing up there every year. And we would just go there and we, they would all have budgets. And I remember talking to sponsors and they would be like, well, I'm like, if they don't have 10 grand heli, they can't even come. And they need another 10 grand on reserve when we go over because we're going to go over. And people would be like, that's, I'm like, we're going to explore, we're, we need unlimited, but and they would, you know, back then in the 90s, there was more money in snowboarding, so it wasn't like this big, it was a big ask, but it wasn't gigantic. And these guys all had fat budgets, and standard, we had our budget, the standard films budget, and the riders all had, you know, ten to $20,000 each to spend on just heli time. It's not counting your airfare, or your food, or your lodging, that's just strictly heli time. Mm. And I would tell the riders, too, like, you've got to have the budget or don't come, because we're going big, mm-hmm. and we're going deep. That's sick. Yeah. And I think to, you know, Jeremy Jones was telling me just to explain this too which I haven't hasn't hit me like this but there's there's only a couple major videos at this point in snowboarding right so so to be in one of these major videos is a big deal like you are one of the elites you are one of the top pros you are you are at the top of the the totem pole in snowboarding so to speak so it makes sense like okay we're making a big budget it's not like there's 70 videos you know so it's like if you're in this video it's a big deal it's a big production video and you guys are going to make something rad, right? Yeah. I mean, when back then it was, there, there were just a few videos. And if you're in, like you said, if you were in it, you, you could make a career off it. If you were in a Mac dog movie, if you're in a standard movie, an absence movie, a whitey movie, you could literally make, you didn't have to do contests. You didn't have to do, you know, you could make a career off it. And Transworld snowboarding and snowboarder was big too. And they would team up their editorial stuff with the shoots. So you would get editorial content as well as your movie part. So we'd have photographers with us the whole year. So it's kind of a, you, I mean, yeah. I mean, Johan Olofsson, Slaznik. I mean, those guys, Noah did contests in the early days, but he made his whole career off video parts. Mm. I mean, this is an important, I think this is an important time talking about, you know, you mentioned super spines earlier. Noah Selaznik, could you just try to put into words like the the profound impact that Selaznik had on on snowboarding? Yeah, yeah, I could. Um, I could try. He has had like some of the best skate style 
any snowboarder ever had. And he took it to the, the mountains, big mountains, small, you know, Tahoe mountains. He took this insane skate style and it didn't matter if it was a Tahoe line. I can think of a shot in TB4, three turns down this chute, front three, no grab, boom, land, two turns and a slash. It's just that. It's nothing, nothing crazy on slope shot, but we sh- dogger shot the shot. I shot in slow mo, so my shot got clipped. He sh- dogger shot at real time, and it's so dope. If you watch that shot, it's just like three turns, front side three. I think it's a toe and a heel out or whatever, and it's just that is snowboarding. I mean, that it just doesn't get any better than that. I mean, he was like the master of style and made it look so easy. And it'll, it could be like a butter at Mount Hood on flat ground. It could be those three turns to front three. And then he took it to super spines. And he just, I watched him and I got to live it with him because we, we filmed it together. And I watched him progress from the simplest Tahoe lines to the biggest, gnarliest lines in Alaska. And it was always still that kind of skate style. Just bunnying down the hill, just ollie in this big slough and just spinning wherever and so smooth. The best. Yeah, you yeah. you had to be a Slaz fan, Jones, right? I mean, Slaz was, yeah, that was my in. That was my my gateway drug for sure. And then probably just my main line. Like, that was the main feed. He was just all of those things you said, and it was unbelievable. Just the buttering, the 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 extreme. It was like jibbing always, yeah. always. Even in the extreme sitch, he was just like, Throwing a bonk or throwing a spin or throwing just a stylus sla- mm-hmm. slash that just wasn't, I mean, it was, it's beautiful. Yeah. And he was so comfortable up there in Alaska too. Mm. Cause we lived it together. I'd be like, oh, we're looking at spines, you know, we're looking at these big lines and talking about the hazards and the ways down. And he was just, he was just so comfortable. It was just like this, it was like just clockwork working with him. Do you ever Fearless feel, kind of? Sorry, you, Chris. Oh, no, no. Uh, well, I was just going to say there's something to like watching the old, the videos with this skate footage and he's shredding vert mm. ramps and he's ripping on a skateboard. And if you look at people over the years that have been just like really top level, like almost professional skateboarders and snowboarding, I mean, like obviously Sean White can shred a vert ramp, but like there's you have Jed Anderson's unbelievable on a skateboard, uh, you know, Jake Kuzik. But I, I just feel like sometimes there's. There's, there's many I'm forgetting, but when people are that talented on a skateboard and they step onto a snowboard, they just seem to have something different in terms of just being comfortable on the, on the board. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah. I mean, maybe it's because you're not strapped in on a skateboard and <laughs> it's gnarlier to some extent sometimes. The, yeah. The tricks and how hard you can pay on street stuff. I don't know. Just, yeah. It's that skate style. It all goes back to that skate style. Chris Roach, yeah. Cardiel, yep. Salaz. I mean, people really, I don't know, really should keep an eye on that stuff moving forward because I don't want to, you don't want to see it go too gymnastic, which I guess is a whole other topic. Mm-hmm. But um, there's something about that skate style, you know, you know, mm-hmm. and just, it's just so cool to watch. And you can tell, I mean, it's, if someone's never skateboarded or they, they've got a coach or they're in the pipe and yeah, they can do all these crazy spins and win a contest, but like, do you really got it? Do you really actually have the steez? And some people don't. And I just, it's <laughs> just, it's so important. Yeah. It's the flat bottom. How do you look across that? You know, like it's yeah. kind of, that kind of tells the story, especially in a pipe. Like if you can get out of a 22 foot pipe, like, and you look good in the flat bottom, I think well, you're in a good lane. Well, that's the other lane. thing too. I, like Ayumu, for example, can shred vert. You look at him, ride, he looks good and he looks lands good. at the top of the transition every hit. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, I have a very great question from none other than Pat Bridges. Here we go. Hey, Mike. It's uh, Pat Bridges here. I got to say, I had a great time last season riding with you a ton, and I look forward to doing it again this year. Uh, I've heard you talk a couple times about this, but I can't get enough of it. Maybe it's because I'm goofy foot, but... uh, can you elaborate on why you your theory on goofy footers and spines in Alaska? Looking forward to hearing this one. Thanks. Bye. Oh, me too. <laughs> yeah, Pat. Sick. I remember that conversation we had. We were riding some pal with Pat Moore at uh, Diamond Peak on the one day we were talking about it. But yeah, 
So goofy footers on spines, uh, and I'm going to specify the area because Hanes is different than Valdez. So in Valdez, most of the spines, the best spines are northwest facing, and so it's evening light. And a lot of them face your toe edge if you're goofy on these spines, coming up to the spine, to the wall of the spine, and you're riding down the spine. Let's say you come up. If you look at super spines, for instance, Noah comes on a toe, hits it, heel, toe. He's riding the toe edge on the, on the inside of the spine, and then he ollies over backside, and then the next side, he's sending his slough down. He's doing slough management. He's working it across a few turns, sending his slough down, so a lot of the spines in Alaska and Valdez in particular are lined up for goofy footers where uh, if you're a regular footer, you'd be on kind of fighting it on a heel. Not that you, you could ride it, but you couldn't maybe ride it as good. And Jeremy Jones, um, you think of him and the, and being a goofy footer in Alaska, and, you know, Landvik, but I mean, as far as spine specialists, let's just say, you know, Selaznik and Jeremy Jones, those guys, they're goofy footers in Valdez and it just, it's the way they line up. Mm. If you go to Haynes, a lot of the best spine stuff is in the morning light, and it's actually the opposite. It's it's a it's a regular footers the way you're lined up because they're the way they're facing, and you're again you're coming up on a toe, and it's the you're facing the spine, the crux of it, and the way you ride the spine, the way your slough goes. Yeah, and I should mention Travis Rice obviously too as a goofy footer in Valdez, you know. So it's the way the spine it's the way the spines face. It's where your slough's going. It's how you ride it. And it's when it's in the sun, because you're not going to ride a super gnarly spine line in the shade. It's hard to see, and it's not going to look good on film for mm-hmm. two, but mainly it's just hard to see. Mm-hmm. And you can't even really see the features until the stuff comes. You might fly by something in, in the shade and not even really think it's that rad. And then you go in the sun, you're like, oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so some, ass, some, some spines are better to ride in the morning. Uh, because the aspect, yes. and some are better to ride in the evening because the aspect, correct? Yes. Haynes is a morning spot. Yep. Valdez is an evening spot And then in what, general. Ab- what about snowpack midday? Like it can get a little spicy when it gets, starts it, getting cooked, right? In, in Alaska? Yeah. Well, a lot of this, it can get spicy for Avi down low if, for heating, but also just most of the best terrain in Alaska is either morning or evening light. Okay. And, I've, and I've found that, in my opinion, Valdez is an evening area for the most part. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Haynes is more of a morning area, but there's also a lot. Haynes kind of has both. And I'm only talking about two. There's a lot more spots in Alaska besides Haynes and Valdez, but those are two of the main spots. And it, you were the main pioneer of Haynes, right? That's kind of. Not, not Haynes. No. Or, uh, Valdez. Yeah, Valdez. Valdez. Sorry, rather. Yeah. 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 And I wouldn't say I'm the main pioneer. We, we pioneered a lot of Valdez in the early days with the crew, with Johan and, you know, Victoria and Dave Downing and. Tex and Tom Burt. Um, yeah. So we, we did a lot of the pioneering. Um, but there was other guys, you know, Jerry Hans, a skier, he was out there. He had these clients from Disney, and they, would, they had a private, and they would go big and explore a bunch of stuff. And you had the early days. You had Eric Piotta and, you know, Peterson, those guys were um, rap films. And there was other crews out there exploring. I mean, we weren't the only ones exploring, but we were probably the biggest snowboard film crew there. And we definitely, like I mentioned earlier, had pretty big budgets and we could go really deep and, and explore entire areas that people hadn't really ridden that much. Were you sharing any of these, uh, any of these explorations with those other groups since you were all kind of, uh, I mean, pioneering it to a sense in your own right and groups like would you come in contact, share info, help each other out, or was it more kind of clicky? It was a little clicky, but we would share some info. Like Jerry Hans, for sure, we would share info with him because he was going to a lot of the same zones we were. We were working our way towards Cordova, where, where there's points North Heli now. And they've been in business over 20 years, and we were working our way towards Cordova before they were even in operation. We would actually go all the way over there, have lunch at the airport, and then fuel up, have lunch in Cordova, and then fly back to Valdez. And the, but there was very sketchy. In wasn't much info. Not many people had been out there. No one really knew anything. So you're just kind of flying out towards the Schwann Glacier or the Allen Glacier. You're kind of going towards the Copper River and banging a right, and you're like going up some drainage, and no one's really been there, and you're just gigantic mountains, detention center, super spines, Cordova Peak. You're just, no one had ridden Cordova Peak. And we just going out there and no one's ridden that thing. That's the biggest, gnarliest line I see. And Tom Burt's like, dude, that thing's going down, you know? Mm. So 
So it's just kind of, yeah, you're just basically cruising around and you're just exploring. Like we can land there, you can ride down, you can get picked up there. And there was, yeah, there just wasn't a lot of info. But um, it was funny because when I think about it now, I'm like, wow, we were kind of exploring that. But back then I wasn't even really thinking, we were just doing it. Yeah. Like, let's yeah. get some good clips. Yeah, let's get some good clips and go ride some POW. But I mean, I, and a lot of it too was my personal addiction to riding powder. Yeah. Like, I mean, that was... <laughs> I got to admit, I mean, <laughs> the reason I would go to Valdez was to make a snowboard, a big part of the snowboard movie, and another was to feed my addiction. And we had this big thing with Standard. It's like we are free riding 30% of the day, no cameras, no tripods, no photos, Sick. straight Damn. free riding. And people would be like, and we had the budget. You know, like nowadays the budgets are a lot smaller and you can't afford to do as much. But back then, we would, because it was addicting. I mean, who doesn't want to go ride the wall? Who doesn't want to ride meteorite? Who doesn't want to ride the diamond or pontoon or all those stuff? I mean, that's they're the, some of the best runs in the world. Of course you want to go ride them. Like after Rippy did Sphinx, I mean, he guy took photos and we shot it and then put the doors back on the heli. He'd done it the first year for TB5 and just him and Coombs got to ride it. We went back the next year, TB6. He guy took photos and it's the cover shot of TB6. Rippy rides down it. Coombs rides down and I film both and I get this killer shot of Coombs for the ski movie for TGR. And then we, we get down, we're putting the doors back on. I'm like, he guy, like, now we're going to go ride it. He just like looks at me. He's like, really? I'm like, yeah, dude, now it's our turn. So we put the doors on and rode Sphinx after, you know, Rippy and Coombs did it. And it's an awesome run. You're out there. You got to do it. That's why that's like, so that's why I, a lot of the reasons I did the stuff in Valdez is so I could just go ride it. Not to say I would go ride Cordova peak or some of the nasty lines that Tom Burton, those guys did, but the easier runs, not that Sphinx is necessarily easy, but, um, but some, I would dare to ride powder basically mm. at the end of the day. That's, I mean, Man. aren't we all out there to do that? I mean, media, can, media guys got to get theirs too. That's yeah, important. Straight it's up. very important. And also too, when you slow down a little and you look at the mountains and the lighting and you do take a free, a free ride with no cameras and on some of the easier terrain, you look around, you find stuff that's epic for filming that would have been better than if you just rushed out there to shoot because you can get a feel of the avi conditions, mm -hmm. the riders mm -hmm. get to feel it better. And, and you just end up with a better end product, I think, because you can get your feet wet and you can kind of get loose and like feel it. Would it give you a different perspective on what the writers were doing when you're able to be on the same faces? I mean, there's the like Sphinx. Is that the one you, you yeah. named? Like it's an easier run, but there's a beauty to them running it first and, and doing those first tracks and the, and the style in which they do it. And you're able to run that run. But that gives you an appreciation. It's got to, to like look at like how you would talk a rider into something that they're maybe concerned about or looking at to get a clip, and you can kind of give them both perspectives. For, to, to, definitely to a certain extent. Knowing where sloughs are going to go, how fast they're going to run, what the dangers are, how big is the Burke shrunk at the bottom, if they have to ollie, is it firm on the outrun, is the mm -hmm. debris frozen? Mm -hmm. All little things that maybe some filmer might overlook if you didn't know, and you got to think about these things when you're talking to riders because it's a, it's a team decision, and anything can go wrong at any time. So, yeah, it, I think it does help to know what those factors are, what, what the danger factors are, and when, where to help really... You know, and I'm probably annoying with some of the riders because I'm like, I probably overdo it. I'm Mr. Sa too much safety too mm -hmm. many times. And I sometimes like, I tell myself to shut up. You know, I'm like pointing out all these things. And John Jackson's like, Spike, I got it, dude. I'm like, okay, I'll shut up now. Just go ride it. I'll film it. But if they know, they know. They'll like, they'll call you out like John. He's just like, no, we're good. Yeah. But he'll listen when he's nervous for sure. Yeah. He's got to. Alaska's, you know, you always got to be heads up out there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But I, I just, it's, it's funny to think back to those days between, I want to say 1995 and 2000, again, when those budgets were so big and just like riding so much powder and still coming home with like 20 minutes of footage for the movie and just laughing and going, if Burton knew how much money we just blew, all their, all their budgets, I mean, oh, not blew. I mean, they, they got their 20 minutes of footage, but I'm like, thanks, Jake, for uh, – Paying for forty grand a heli time for us and all your riders because well, they got super <laughs> dope. They got an industry supporting them and buying their product because 
that support you did in launching it. It's yeah, an it ecosystem. Go, you know? It's yeah. an ecosystem. Yeah. I remember yeah. one day in 2000, I think it was nine, it was, we, we had gotten so much footage. It was Victoria and I, Doug Coombs and his wife, and we got so much footage, we free rode all day, private heli, just the four of us, and then Swanee was our guide. And we went out and we did pontoon, meteorite, diamond in the wall all in one day, no cameras, wow. just for fun. Wow. And I'm like, this is, that to me was like the, maybe the pinnacle of my, I don't want to say life, but filming, it was like, that was, and knowing you had 20 minutes of footage in the cam for the movie already. Like, oh. Also, too, yeah. think about when you're making a video and everybody's having a good time, the vibes are high, that shows in the video. When you have, when you're just there, strictly business, not fucking around, like, and it's, it, it seems like it's worth it, you know, to make sure you're having a good time because you're part of the crew, too. Yeah, I think it's important for everyone to have a good time. Be safe, have fun, make a rad movie if you can, and, and bring everyone home in one piece and have a good time. And yeah, it's super important. And these days, I feel like it's 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 the conditions are more tricky. I think they, there's more wind up than Alaska, and mm -hmm. um, the storms. It just it doesn't seem like the conditions. They are good, but not doesn't seem to be as good as often as it used to be. Mm. What about also? Uh, you know, think about when you're buzzing around and you think something's a 25 foot cliff, but you get on slope mm -hmm. and it's like a 200 foot cliff. Have you guys experienced that out there? Definitely, yeah. But we're usually pretty. We've experienced it, but no, maybe not quite. Someone going off a, you know, not no one ever airing a cliff, but some, that thing was twice the size I thought it was. Yeah. But but these days we're we've got some John J Jackson, for instance, this year flying around with him. He's got so much experience that we'll fly around and we'll all look at it and in take a minute with the heli to fly real close and really look at it. Mm -hmm. Go, okay, what are we looking at here? Like, we're looking at five turns. Slough's going to go down there. I'm going to cut this way. There's a 30-foot cliff at the bottom. Get your shit together and go over the shrun, and you're all good. Like, we're, like, we're really looking at it from top to bottom and really planning it out. Mm. We got a guess, another guest question from Kevin Jones. Here we go. Spike. <laughs> KJ again. Hey, you're single-handedly responsible for maybe, what, like 150 snowboarders' pro careers. Uh, talk to me about that. Talk to our audience about that. <laughs> Dang. And what it takes to mentor these people. Like, personally, you were my biggest mentor. What What is that like, having that responsibility to bring kids into the backcountry and teach them how to not kill themselves? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, KJ. Um <laughs> Yeah, I mean that, that's a cool that's that's I mean, that's nice for him to say. Um, it's always been fun to bring younger kids in the backcountry and teach them the ropes. I, I taught John Jackson how to snowmobile. And I remember like the second day he went out, he drove off in the flat light. We were up at this spot in Tahoe, and he drove off his like eight foot embankment onto boilerplate ice on the lake and almost almost weeded himself. <laughs> got a little bit of gas at the very end and like brought the nose up. He's like, Oh my dude, that was crazy. I'm like, I told you it's flat light. He wanted to buzz around afterwards and I'm like, be careful. It's flat light. It's the end of the day. He's like learning to snowmobile. I'm just be careful. And, and he learned his lesson right off the bat. And I'm like, I told you so flat light. You can't see, but yeah, it's, it's fun to take people out and point those little things out to them. And just like we we're talking about earlier, that's a cornice. That's a train trap. That's this. That's it's very to me. It's very basic. If you just like common sense, and I love to just bring like UC Austin in. It's like brought him out pretty much for the first time, and it's just been fun to bring those guys out, show them the ropes, and um, watch them learn and watch because you know how good these guys and girls are on a snowboard. So it's so cool. Like for me, there's also a selfish part about it. Like this guy's going to learn how to do this and I'm going to get the dopest shots mm. and we're going to have a super fun time doing it. So it's always been a fun thing just to mentor people and teach them about the back country and how to travel around it and come back in one piece. You know, it's always just been a fun thing to do and point stuff out to people and then just watch people arrow I mean, I could, yeah, there's a big list. It's, it's, it's fun. A bottomless list. It is. Yeah. And it's fun to, and a lot of times, Back in the nine in the whatever the mid nineties, everyone stayed at the Standard Films house. There wasn't Burton. We were trying to save him some money, so I ever stay at the Standard Films house. We had like four bedrooms, and everyone just stayed there. So they just stay at my house, and we wake up at whatever five a.m. and barge out in the backcountry and go have fun together. You know, I want to point something out that I mean, we keep talking about it, and there's so much 
like jibbing and kind of urban influence in so many of the names that you you've listed. And when you look back at your portfolio of TV movies, they're they're so well rounded. Like from from a writing component component, you get pitted in this lane often as just this big mountain kind of movie. And but you've been you've shown it all the whole time, which is pretty rad. And if you go look at it, you can see it with that perspective for sure. And there's some years, of course, that were a little softer than others. But I mean, like the years you were talking about off air, Chris, of, you know, like Matt Hammer years and these years where you had a heavy street scene going in them, you know, and I just not even a question, just an appreciation and throw it your way like that. And to let everyone else know, to like take a look at that and maybe take some notes because that that's respectable. That's hard to do. Things are so genre based, and you always well, kept it well rounded. Yeah, we we tried our best to try and you know we definitely leaned more big mountain, but we tried to shoot as much urban stuff as we could and park and cheese wedges and yeah, like Torstein Horgamo and Haldor Helgesen yeah. and. Mm. There are parts like Torstein's parts and like the storming and stuff like that. There are some pretty good, you know, really good Montreal footage. And, mm -hmm. you know, we never were on the Mac dog level, maybe some shots here and there for sure. But uh, we weren't on like, but then again, Mac dog wasn't out in Alaska exactly. doing what we were doing, but he would show backcountry riding and huge wedges and a little bit of free riding too. But for sure. Yeah. But we tried to always dabble that. And even back to the TB two days when we first started, that was always our mission was to show the whole gamut of snowboarding, whether it's street, big mountain, Alaska, Tahoe, backcountry, powder riding, pillows. Cause I mean, snowboarding is everything. It's, it's, that's what snowboarding is. It's all these different features that you ride on. Mm -hmm. So I will always try and shoot all these different features mm -hmm. as much as possible. Maybe with the exception of not that much half pipe and not that much park, just because it gets shown so much on, on during the contest season. But yeah, so to me, it's like, really trying to show the whole gamut of all different types of riding has always been one thing I've always been drawn to with snowboard filmmaking is to really sh show it all. Mm -hmm. Now we had Mac dog on here and he mentioned he's when he was talking about making videos, he's like, it's about creating a feeling. You want to create a feeling like that's, that's what the video part is, is a feeling. Do you have a, an approach to what you're trying to create? Like what your bigger picture is? I think, yeah. To, to, yeah. It's basically, athlete based high action snowboarding to good music and just really showing the, again the whole gamut e whatever that rider is what are they good at what what are they what can they do can they do rails can they do cheese wedges in the backcountry can they ride alaska just taking that rider taking all their different skill set and boiling it down to a, a 3 to 7 minute part to a really banging song or two and kind of trying to put their personality and vibe across as much as possible and also travel maybe it's an alaska seggy or a deep powder seggy and trying to really like this year we have like this deep powder moment with this one song in tahoe and it's just got this vibe it's just deep powder riding for a minute but it's got this cool vibe that roto did and it's kind of that vibe where you watch it and i think anyone that watches the movie this year will be like wow that's sick deep powder I think I want to go ride some sick deep powder. Like mm -hmm. I want to inspire people to go out and go snowboarding. You know, that's, that's one of the main things too. Like my love for filmmaking, showing how good an athlete is and go snowboarding because it's rad, cause it's a rad activity. Mm. Love that. Back to mentorship. Uh, Kevin was saying that you would also mentor people in other ways. Like if somebody's late to the trailhead, you might just take off and leave without them to prove a point, right? Sometimes, yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, when we say, what's the saying? If you're not five minutes early, you're late or whatever it is. I mean, especially in the backcountry. If someone says 5.30 at the trailhead, probably should be there at 5.15, you know, unloading your sled. You know, definitely don't be there at 5.35. If you're there at 6, you're definitely um, going to get it, you know, we'll leave a note on the car and tell you where we're at. You know, but yeah, we left. And some days are more important than others, you know, the, the super bluebird powder free ride days are the most coveted and those are the days you definitely can't be late if you have a wedge built and you're half an hour late and the wedge is already built and you're going somewhere and you know where you're going that's a different story you know and you know what's in the sun but yeah those those blue those bluebird free ride days like don't be late yeah and and also the lighting too the lighting's the mm -hmm. best you get you know it's just the way it rolls yeah i mean 
I mean, I want to go to the lighting and something I think I benefited from from you. One of the many was a half dome mission I did, and it was pattern off something that we heard you had done. I don't even remember. I don't know if it's true or not. And so, but it was showing up literally at like three in the morning at half dome and starting that hike up. And the second that light like comes over the roll, you hit it. And like, I did that with Brad Kramer and it was all, I mean, we never left you out of the conversation cause we just believed you invented that <laughs> on that half dome, <laughs> but like show up early and yeah and boot in and that's that's how you get that kind of shot and so I can't speak to a shot but I just wanted to thank you for for that inspiration cuz I got one of my favorite shots there so yeah it was good right. on that mission I'm glad and by pleasure and I mean and that and that half dumb light too mm. that was some of our, our original inspiration was right there at new we call it new donner on the i80 drop that that light when the light first hits that thing it, it comes the sun comes up and it's pink light and it just beams right on that thing it's magical magical i I mean you just want to be there it's like this is like remember with my brother exploring around there and just realizing how that was some of our original inspiration too is that new that whole area how the light from sunrise till about 11 30 in the morning is just so insane and we were eating tacos at i think 11 15 yeah down in Truckee. yeah you can be (laughs) clipped up yeah, clipped up two yeah. two big stomps for your part and so sick. eating a taco by eleven. Yeah, it's like perfect. That's Man. that's veteran shit where the the rook the rookie move is it's eleven fifteen, you're still snowmobiling around or walking around trying to figure out what the hell you're gonna hit, right? <laughs> <laughs> They're yeah. grabbing their their celebratory taco and you're grabbing your your breakfast burrito to head up. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah, totally. Yeah. That new Donner light, man, it's it's like like I said, it's one of the original inspirations that spot that's so cool i didn't know it was i mean i knew it was light driven but to hear it like that where that it was solely just let's go get that light let's clip up in it i love that so epic i mean the light doesn't get any better than that Mm -mm. all right we're gonna take a quick break and talk to you guys about the icon pass because winter is right around the corner resorts are about to start opening they got the icon session pass starting at only 319 dollars adult The Icon Pass Session 2-Day, 3-Day, and 4-Day Pass options offer a range of affordable entry points for the over 50-plus Icon Pass mountains. They also got the Icon Base Pass with limited blackout days across most of the 50-plus mountains. And of course, they got the Icon Pass. Only the Icon Pass provides the most access to the most mountains with no blackout dates. That's every bit of good stuff possible. They got over 178,000 skiable acres across more than 50 destinations worldwide. The good stuff is almost here. Again, from only $319 adult, stay ready with your at Icon Pass to 50 plus destinations worldwide. Hey, uh, Silk, should we just hit a quick smelling salt real fast? Yeah, I might need you to throw me one over here. Yeah. Kind of kind of dry right now. Yeah. Here, Jones. Hand me that one. I'm, I'm out. Start it off. So. Need, here's All right. One. Bombhole.com. Oh, oh, oh that's wow. good. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Oh. That's a good one. Oh, my God. That's good. All right. We're back. We're rolling. All right. Um, so I got a hard-hitting question. Can you explain a meth <laughs> <laughs> A methyk? A methyk. A methyk. It's basically a method gone bad, and Damien Sanders named it after me. It's a, yeah, it's a hinged. I can, I can never really do a method. I can barely grab my board, and um, it's like tr- me. Tr- it's my, it's Mike Spike method Mathike, just kind of all those wrapped <laughs> into one. It's a method gone bad. It's me just hinging up, kind of grab my nose and not really bone in the back leg out, just kind of like hinging, just kind of like. It's Mike trying to do a method, and it was me. And it was in hard shells. I was in pink hard shells trying to tweak this method on an old avalanche board. And Damien Sanders, Damien Sanders is like, "It's a mathike," and it just stuck. <laughs> Good or bad, there's not too many people that have a method named after yeah. him. So props to that. <laughs> Good or the bad, mathike. it's memorable. It's yeah. memorable. It's memorable. Yeah. All right, we got a guest question from the legendary Dave Downing. Here we go. Hey, Bomb Hole crew. This is Dave Downing. Uh, I heard you got my catch it in studio. I'm super stoked about that. 
Uh, Mike, thank you so much. Just wanted to say thank you to you and uh, all you've done for me in snowboarding and really to all everything you've done in snowboarding. Um, just all the, the awesome filming you've done, the work, the blood, sweat, and tears. Um, anybody who's ever watched somebody snowboard down a big mountain owes everything to you because you pioneered it all. And uh, I just want to th- say thank you to you and all you've done. Um, but yeah, I got a guest question. It's kind of funny, but I spent you know 25 years hanging out with you and learning your terminology. And I want you to explain to the viewers um, what these three different terms are. Uh, the first one is, what's a tipper gore? Explain what a tipper gore is. Um, number two is milk of toast. Explain that one. And the third one I want you to explain is what's a mathike? Um, Mike, I love you and uh, hope you're enjoying the time in there. Um, and also... Got a bonus question, actually. You guys could probably talk about this for an hour, but why don't you guys talk about Johan and that trip to Alaska for uh, TB5 and just that whole time time period and just uh, what a what an amazing experience that was. I got to live it, and I know you did too, and just uh, yeah, talk about that one. All right, buddy. Talk to you later. Bye. Cool. Tipper Gore, that's the first one. Tipper gore is when you're on your snowmobile and you go up on a, you know, maybe a little, not a wind lip, but a little, just a little bit of pow. And you turn, you know, everyone does on a snowmobile these days. You turn your handlebars one way and you just tip your sled. And that's a tipper, tipper gore. Mm. And then tipper gore was also the, was she a senator? Yeah, uh, Al Gore's wife. Is Al, yeah, and she was the one that did. <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. No She's the one that got all the, the everything censored on a CD, which is explicit lyrics. She was at the forefront of making CDs with with cuss words or whatever. She's that where it says explicit lyrics on the old CDs. That's she was the forefront of making that happen, mm. and she was in a big lawsuit. I think um, it was was it D. Schneider from Twisted Sister and maybe Jello Biafra were the big speakers. Um, very well spoken, both of them. They were they did a full. You can look it up on the internet. I think it's Jello. Um, but yeah, look it up sometime. Tipper Gore, you, know, you got the whole story right there about how why you have to have your stuff censored because she is the one. Wow. Mm. Yeah. So th- then we have these words, you know, Tipper Gore, and then what was the other one he just asked me? I it wrote was, it down. Uh, something Mikula Toast or something. Oh, uh, mil- Mikula Toast. We we joke around the backcountry. We have all these like saying. So Mikula Toast is 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 milk milky skies. You're out trying to film your seggy and it milks mm. up. It's Melkola Toast. But there's also, you know, Nicola Toast, Melkola Toast. Um, Duff McKagan <laughs> is powder. Duff yeah. McKagan. I mean, epic powder is, dude, what's, how's the snow today? It's Duff McKagan. He's yeah. also the bass player for Guns N' Roses. You know? yeah, that's going in rotation yeah. as of right yeah. now for me. That one and was in rotation I got a, a lot. <laughs> I, yep. I got a whole list. Yeah, Neil Blender, you mm-hmm. know, maybe you did a, a no grab front ten. It probably should have been a seven, but you w- tried all whirly burled and you got it's a Neil Blender. A Neil Blender. Neil Blender. You know, we just we joke <laughs> and we got you know Kenny Loggins. Yeah, that's when you're logging your your login footage at home. You know, I a thin Lizzie, <laughs> dust on crust. You know, you're, it's it's you know two inches on ice. It's thin Lizzie. Yeah, I mean the list goes on and on. I could probably sit here for an hour and spray off the dictionary but uh, for the, sure yeah but we have a lot of them we just joke around and then the mathike we already you know we did mathike but the math uh, mathike's a method gone bad by spike because i don't know how to do methods it's a hinged really bad hinged not even a method in hard hard boots it's really bad yeah. and then the last part he wanted to go tb5 uh that the johan segment okay Alaska. yeah yeah so TB5, Johan segment was probably one of the f- most favorite segments I've ever gotten a chance to film, be part of. And Johan Downing told me about Johan. He's like, there's this kid, Johan Olofsson, you should shoot him. He's mainly the Swedish half-pipe kid, but he's really good. And Renee Hansen sent him over on um, Downing's you know, recommendation. And we started taking Johan Hetzel and I and Johan and my brother. We started going out to Blue Lakes, going out in Tahoe backcountry. And um, he just started ripping. I was like, oh, this is a Swedish halfpipe kid. But we started, I took him into this powder zone. He's like, I want to go ride that. And like, okay, just like rips this one face. And I'm like, dude, I'm thinking myself, this guy can free ride. 
and I looked at this one thing. I'm like, how about, Johan, how about, what do you think about that? Maybe half cab off that and, uh, I don't know, maybe do like a combo line off that little double line. And he goes up and boom, just does this double line perfect off this double cliff drop. And then um, it's actually shot in TB5. We take him to the top of this thing called Nipple Cirque, and there's this gnarly straight run he does. In TB5, he does like two turns and just straight runs through this pepper. That was that was like his third powder run in Tahoe. I'm like, Dude. I'm like, okay, this guy can ride a snowboard like down the hill for real. So we kept shooting for another week or two, and then Alaska was coming up. I'm like, hey, Johan, do you want to go to Alaska with us? He's like, sure. And that happened to be the year we went there and teamed up with Valdez, Heli Ski Guides, with Doug Coombs as our guide. Todd and Steve Jones were our guides from Teton and Gravity Research, the founders of Teton. They were our guides as well. We show up in Valdez, five feet of fresh pow, 10 days of bluebird, not a stitch in wind. Stable, go anywhere you want, ride anything you want, not an avalanche in sight, sloughs running perfect speeds, and Johan just goes berserk, completely berserk. And it wasn't, it was like we were talking about earlier, nothing was planned. Oh, go land up there. I'll set up down here. Three turns into a chute, backside 180. Oh, heel skipping right towards some rocks. Oh, cab out and straight run three more turns. I'm just, I'm just like, okay, next shot. Go to some other spine. It's five turns down the spine, backside three off this 20 foot cliff with a slough, slough running on both sides and ride out. Perfect. And it was just, it was just like shot after shot after shot after shot. And he was just, I'd never seen anyone, I mean, one of the best guys I'd ever seen in Alaska. And this was supposedly the Swedish halfpipe kid three weeks, what, a month earlier that I had no, in, no intentions of bringing to Alaska, didn't even know how good of a rider he was. And then he just, those 10 days went, and he just went berserk. And that was his part, you know? And he also shot around Tahoe. He shot that other stuff in Tahoe, but it's, I'd never seen anything like it, you know? I mean, quite the... So aggressive with freestyle mixed in, you know, just so aggressive and fast, but in control at the same time. There's two clips in there that where uh, graphics come up on the screen. It's the Curious George First Ascent. Yeah. Did, yeah. Have you, did you discuss that? Yeah, that we didn't talk. Yeah. So that was a first ascent and that was in Valdez kind of on the behind Mount Billy Mitchell. I'm probably getting too specific, but it's just this little area. It was a super cool snow knob kind of traversing thing above big exposure. And then you go into this one shoot and finish it off. And that was when we were really starting to get into the first descent mode where we were like, okay, let's go find new stuff, big evening objectives that are in perfect light, like the most pristine, pristine thing we can find. Mm. You know, so we started getting to that rhythm where we knew what we were doing. Like, okay, every evening from four till sunset, stuff's going to start coming in the light. It's going to be epic. So we started just picking objectives like that. That was kind of the beginning of um, just like a, a bunch more stuff like that. And then what about the 3,000-foot uh, vertical, 36 <laughs> seconds, 50-degree pitch, where he's just pinned with a 200-foot rooster tail? <laughs> yeah. So if you do the math, if you're a mathematician, I'm probably way off because he's probably going like 80 miles an hour, which isn't possible. So I think I was off a little, but I just was, I guessed that back then I just guessed, is it 2,500 feet or 24? The Coombs had said 3,000. So it's maybe not quite 3,000, maybe it's 24, but yeah, he's probably going 55 miles an hour down this face, top to bottom. And he just rips that thing. And, and um, I just started the shot with a 12 to 120. Jeff Curtis was sitting right next to me. We were on, uh, shooting across. I started the 12 to 20. I zoom in. And I and it's back then. It's kind of hard to see through, through the sixteen millimeters because your eye is so dark and small, and you're so far away. And I could barely see. Sometimes I would open my other eye so I could see. And he just rips this whole thing top to bottom. I can see that rooster tail you're talking about just pluming. That's why I'm just following his rooster tail. And then he gets to the bottom. I just pull wide, and I'm like, he just rode that entire face in like how many seconds? Just ripped that thing, and it was. Just so we ended up putting it, when I was editing the movie, I'm like, that'd be cool to put a graphic there and just say how fast he ripped it and just sh just put a graphic to say how, how big the face is and how long it took him to get down it and not show any cuts. 
Because so many times, some movies are just so cut up. Mm-hmm. It's like if someone rips a line in 30 se- under 30 seconds, top to bottom, and rips it like that, why not just show the whole thing and not show one edit? Love that. Yeah. I love that. And I like the analogy with Johan. I think Downing told me this. You mentioned it earlier. He's like filming wildlife. <laughs> yeah. We <laughs> used to say that. Yeah. Like he's like filming. Yeah. You're just like, you're trying to film in wildlife. If you capture him, if you can, you know, I don't know where I'm going. Sometimes you tell me, like, where are you going, Yana? I don't know. Down, down to the left and to the right. And okay, I'll just back up and just shoot it and follow you. You know, stay yeah. On him, you yeah. Know. Just stay on him. Cause you don't, you don't know exactly what's going to happen, but something cool is going to happen. So that was kind of the, the Johan thing. It was definitely like filming wildlife and he was hard to track down too in real life too. He just was a little bit, you know, he was always hard to pin down. The snow conditions sound like they favored that, that mode a little bit too. In that on this particular trip, like you said, it was just 10 days of just, yeah totally dependable like you could trust it so you guys were in that space and i think people can go a little more wildlife in that sort of scenario because it doesn't feel as i don't know nervous totally and, and it, it's all about the conditions and now we we're talking about earlier about going over Berkstrung at the bottom of a run in valdez maybe the sloughs have been running down it and it froze up overnight and there's big chunks at the bottom and you can't just open it up going 50 miles an hour at the bottom so there's only so many times in Alaska when you can actually pin it from top to bottom. And definitely that was a year of the conditions, like you said, the conditions, it was just, it, it enabled you to do that because it was so good. There was nothing more to do than just pin it. Like, why so not? Bad. One thing we didn't, we skipped over in this thing, uh, TB4, there's two clips of uh, a kayaker <laughs> flying off of a cliff one kind of almost stomps and the other guy like goes into a hole oh next to the gosh. rocks like what's up with the kayaker clips in the on the cliff sends <laughs> so my friend damon gold is the kayaker and he was snow kayaking and my buddy eric perlman that i made the climbing movies with had filmed this snow kayaking for some TV show. I'm like, snow kayaking? I'm like, and I'm watching, I'm, my buddy Damon's a little crazy. I'm like, Damon, you're being kind of crazy. Be careful on that thing. And we were up there shooting that one day and he did the one thing where he kind of skips through. But then the one, like you say, he goes, he goes off a cliff and he's on a snow kayak, but there's no speed to clear anything. And he basically just goes off <laughs> and you can see, he just goes straight down. And he literally, it's like a, a glide crack or whatever coming off the cliff. So it opened up, the warming temperatures opened up the snow and he went, st- whatever, 30 feet and then straight down in that glide crack, like 15 feet and just disappeared. I thought he was dead. When he did, I'm like, oh, his neck's broke. He's, I'm like, he's dead. He's for sure dead. And we ran up there and fished him out and he was totally fine. Ran up there and like, looked down, like, Damien, Damien, what's up? And he's like, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Let me hand you my paddle. And <laughs> <laughs> it was, I, every time I look at that shot, I still laugh. I'm like, how did he not? hurt himself dude wow. i'm so glad i asked you because i'm like what fucking happened to that guy when <laughs> yeah. i'm watching that i'm glad we got to the bottom of that mm-hmm. yeah totally fine not a not even a scratch mm. no that's good yeah all right we're gonna talk goggles and we're gonna talk dragon so gear up for the snow season with dragon alliance the brand who is celebrating their 30th anniversary this year just released their latest snow goggle the nfx mag packed with next level features like their proprietary Luma Lens color optimizing lens technology and Swift Lock Magnetics lens changing system. Everybody loves those magnet lenses. They also got armored venting, they got OTG compatibility, infrared radiation lens options, and bonus lenses. You hear that? Bonus lenses. Now, if that weren't enough, this kit is one of the best values on the market. The NFX Mag, like all Dragon Styles, Provides riders with the kind of high-end technology you want at a price you need. So head on over to DragonAlliance.com and use promo code BOMBHOLE20, all caps, for 20% off your total purchase, valid through December 31st, with the exception of their Black Friday and holiday site-wide sale. Again, that's promo code BOMBHOLE20 for 20% off your order and get yourself some dragons. All right, well, we've been going for a decent amount of time Hey, Silk, do you know what time of the show it is right now? I think it might be a fan favorite segment we like to call Name That Video Part. Name That Video Part. 
All right, we're going to take a quick break, talk to you guys about one of our favorite establishments, and that is Woodward. They're all over North America, but we got one here in Park City, only about 15 minutes away from Salt Lake. Uh, they got everything you need there. The other day, we hit the foam pit. I did a backflip on a scooter into a foam pit. It was exhilarating. They got a world-class skateboard park, both indoor and outdoor, which is great for the hot summers. You got AC and you got heat for the winter. And they're all about progression. So if you want to go snowboarding there this winter and you're a beginner, they got a bunny slope. If you want to learn 1080s, they got a cheese wedge for you. If you want to learn double corks in the half pipe, they got you dialed in from small jumps to big. It's a really fun kind of small resort where you get to do a bunch of laps. You got everything from the Peace Park. If you just want to flow, you got a super pipe. You got big jumps. You got world-class rails. So if you're looking for a good time on the mountain, be sure to check out Woodward Park City this winter. It's a great establishment. They support the show. You guys should support them. Name that video part. How are you feeling for name that video part? Do you know the concept? We play uh, like five, seven seconds of a song. You got to see if you can recall the name and video. Ooh, I don't know. We'll see. Okay. Competence level zero through 10. What do you got for us? Two. Okay. I like that. It's respectable. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Let's see how you do. Change the pain. Oh, what you feel. You keep it yeah. Terry Hawkinson, TB2. Woo! <laughs> Congratulations. Easy. I mean, you edited it and filmed it, so, but uh, it was a long time ago. So congrats. You got yourself a bomb hole. You earned that right there. Bomb hole prize pack. You got some hats. Oh, you man. You got uh, some, probably a hoodie in there. Actually, Silk, Silk packed it. What do you got in there, Silk? Yeah, you got two hoodies. A uh, plethora of hats, a couple beanies, a uh, little mug, a bunch of stickers, a little tote bag, and some smelling salts if you want to make some other people do them. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll go. try it later. You rock climber friends. Yeah. Perfect. Get going on the rock. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm stoked. Awesome. And then for part two, name that video part. This isn't for you. This is for our listeners that are listening to the show. If you know the video part, comment on the photo of Mike on Instagram when this comes out. That's where we pick our winner. We need rider and video. Here we go. Thank you guys for playing. Name that video part. Now, now we haven't really leaned into music. And I know that you play music. You're Videos have a distinct sound, a lot of metal. Where does your music inspo and background come from? Um, I play bass, and my brother plays guitar. We're in a band called Fortress, so I've always... And I've played music since I was in seventh grade. I'm not great at playing bass, but I love music. I have a lot of friends who are musicians. And um, I've always been a metalhead. Um, seventh grade, eighth grade... Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, Metallica, Slayer, um, just Scorpions, um, newer bands, you know, not newer, but, you know, Tool, I, Rush, just always been way into music. When, I remember when ACDC came out back in black and listening to that on vinyl at my friend's house, it, first time ever, just before soccer practice, and him just, us just laying on the couch, he's like put on that album and just going to outer space, freaking out on how good that was. Just I've just always been into music, especially metal, but I definitely appreciate all types of music. And I've just always always been into music. And um, I have one, one quick funny story. When I was in uh, eighth grade, um, Judas Priest, Point of Entry Tour, I want to go to the concert at San Diego State Am Open Air Amphitheater. Ask my dad, hey, dad, Judas Priest is playing. You could not go to a concert without parental supervision. And he's all, you know, he, he knew he had me. Like, I wasn't going to get to go to Judas Priest at that point. And I'm like, okay. So I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, so, dad, if, if I have parental supervision or a chaperone, I can go. And he's like, because my dad was kind of, he was really cool, but he's kind of a hard ass. He's all, yes, you can go. I'm like, okay. I had a paper route, light bulb goes off in the head. I had some money saved. So I go down the next day. This is when tickets were 14 bucks a ticket. I go down and buy five tickets. One for me, one for Dave, one for my best friend, Travis, one for my mom, one for my dad. 
point of entry tour. And then next night at dinner, I'm like, Dad, remember when you said I could go to Jesus Priest if I had a chaperone? He's all, yes. And I just go, okay, you're my chaperone. I just lay out five tickets. Mom, Dad, we're all going to Jesus Priest. No way. Yeah, and my dad was like, <sighs> and it was so cool. Dude. So, and it was like the be- – <laughs> So I, I, most people listening probably won't know this, but this song, but there's a song called Solar Angels. It's the beginning of the album, and they're just strumming. I think they're strumming E, just downbeat. And they open with that song in San Diego State Open Air Amphitheater, and it's the, you got the drum set, and you got these stairs going, big flight of stairs going up to the drum set. It's all up. And K.K. Downing and Glenn Tipton are they're the guitar players and they're strumming E they're strumming this beginning of Solar Angels can you hear the lights are down and it's like this metal concert and they rise up on each side of the drum set and appear and then they kick into the song and Rob Halford comes out and I was just from that moment on it was Judas Priest heavy metal is the best thing I've ever seen I was just freaked out on music ever since then because it was like this moment in my life where I don't know. Hard to describe. These two dudes just come up on two sides of a drum set, strum on a song, and you're just freaked out. And my mom and dad even, they're like, it was pretty entertaining. And, <laughs> and Rob Halford, anyone that knows Judas Priest knows how good Rob Halford's voice is. And, and this is early Priest, too. This is before, like, when I say heavy, um, I'm talking, when I reference this stuff, it's like early Priest, you know, early Iron Maiden up to, like, Number of the Beast, like the early stuff. That's the, it's the shit. And I just, uh, ever since then, I just fell in love with music. Us Festival, Ozzy Osbourne, all that. I would go as many concerts as I go to. Ingwe Malmsteen, Def Leppard, whatever. The list, I can just, you know. Didn't you befriend the Metallica drummer? Uh, the bass player, the bass player? Of Metallica. That- I mean, yeah, the bass player of Metallica, Rob Trujillo, is a good, Robert Trujillo is a good friend of mine. So, yeah, I've just known him forever. He's a snowboarder and a surfer. And we met through snowboard filmmaking and, and, and music, just kind of a mutual friend. And we just hit it off when he was playing um, bass for Ozzy, actually, before he got to Metallica. Mm-hmm. And we became good friends. We, we own property in Mexico together and go on surf trips. And I just actually just talked to him yesterday. He's just, he's just, he's just a total homie, super nice guy. Didn't he like stay with you when he was auditioning for Metallica? Yeah, we were actually, he stayed with me in Tahoe, and we actually met up with James this one time. We had to talk to Hetfield at Jake's, and then we were actually on a trip to Tahiti together when he had talked to him, and it sounded like he was going to get the gig, and Whit Crane, he's the singer for Ugly Kid Joe, is a good friend of mine, too, and Whit and I and Robert, we were on a surf trip to Tahiti, to Mar- oh, we were in Morea surfing, and he got the second call from Lars, and he's like, I think they want me in the band. I'm pretty sure. He's like, what do you guys, he was like asking me, like, what do you think? I'm like, dude, definitely join Metallica. He was in, he was going to join no matter what, but he was just kind of, I guess he was just kind of bouncing it off his friends just mm-hmm. for some, some feedback, you know? What a cool thing to be a part of. Like that's, that's some history really. The dude's been there for a minute now. And I mean, that's who I know is the, now the Metallica bass player, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, the early stuff, but that's what a cool moment. It was really cool. And Robert's a total homie. He's got no ego. He's just like a bro sitting there having a conversation. Doesn't even, you wouldn't even know he's the best. player. How's he on a talk. snowboard? He's pretty good. Goofy, he surfs good too. Mm. Yeah, he, we've surfed some, some good waves in Morea. He surfed Tahiti. He can surf over Coral Reef. Damn. He, he can slash powder. He, he's, he's, yeah. he's got a good back seven. Footer. Or? So you got a good back seven? No back seven. Okay. Just wondering. Yeah, he's goofy footer. Nice. Yeah. Good looks, Rob. Uh, all right, so we're cruising along. We talked to Johan. I mean, we could talk Johan TB5 for another six hours if we need to, really. <laughs> um, and, you know, moving along, I think another notable name that comes in around that time, maybe shortly after, is starting to film with uh, Jeremy Jones. Yeah. And riding. He seems like he really took that, those spicy, big spines and just ran with it from, from, from there, uh, I'd love to hear you talk about uh, linking up with Jeremy and filming with him. Yeah, I mean, Jeremy is probably the best s- snowboarder to ever like strap a board on when it comes to big mountain riding. High speed, spines, through pepper, over convex rolls, knowing where he's at, knowing how to negotiate sloughs. He's probably the best, I'd say the best big mountain rider ever. Um, 
in my opinion, I mean, easily. Um, and in getting to film a lot of his stuff, you know, around Tahoe and just the lines, it's just his line selection and his knowledge is just unparalleled. Like anyone that's ever ridden down a convex roll and a blind convex roll and you're trying to pick out a little landmark and know where you're at, it's not easy. And it's so easy just to stop and get lost and my slough's, my slough's going to hit me or I don't know where I'm going. And I don't know how Jeremy does it, to be honest, on some stuff. I don't know how he even knew where the hell he was at, but he always knows where the hell he's at. Hmm. And I just, it's just um, unmatched. Yeah. Just, he, he was mentioning that you guys would be in Tahoe building cheese wedges and then nobody in the crew would want to hit the cheese wedges. So you just tee him up with like line after line after line. Yeah, the, totally. We would just be, yeah, he'd be out and be, you know, if you were, we're building a wedge, yeah, and Jeremy would be like, I'm going to go hit that. I'm going to go hit that. We're like, cool. And we just flank off in a, a different areas and he'd just have it all to himself because no one wanted to ride the stuff. Mm-hmm. What about that one? It looks like a Tahoe spine. I think it's in the end, is Ender in Paradox? Mm-hmm. The Grizzly Spines? Yeah, Grizzly Spines. Yeah. That was gnarly. That's a gnarly line, totally a gnarly line, and it's been written by a few people since. I know Lena's done it, and it's a gnarly line. It's a cool. It's another. It's a goofy foot line because mm-hmm. it's on your toe edge, mm-hmm. and uh, that thing is just a big kind of like toe side elevator above gnarly exposure at the beginning, and you got to watch your slough, and then the further you get down, and it gets a little safer and safer, safer. You can't really fall at the top. Um, it, if you fall at the top, you probably wouldn't. I don't know. You might not survive, mm-hmm. but um, is the more you get down it, once you get like halfway down it, I think you get to where you could actually get sloughed. And we were looking at that line for typical Tahoe. We were looking at stuff for years, kind of like I think you could ride that on the right day. And we the, the on Paradox, we tried it like a week before, and it the clouds came in and it got kind of hot, weird, like warmed up, and the slough started getting kind of heavy. And he was up on top of the line, and it was just about to do it, and the clouds came in. He went down a teeny bit, just not very far, like just kind of felt the snow out and radioed up and said, I don't like this. And I'm like, well, the light's flat anyways and seems kind of sketch. Let's just come back. So he backed off. And then a week later, it snowed again, got clear. Temps were perfect. It was like eight inches of fresh, and he just slayed the line. It was perfect. That's the one in Blue Lakes? No, that's in uh, Blackwood Canyon. Blackwood. Yeah. And it has the, it's the convex roll into that too. No, no, there's not a convex roll. Side hill into it. Yeah, you kind of just come from these trees. The convex roll before that's on is on Sunken Meadow, which is the meadow just before it. It's up on the next shelf. Got it. Yeah. It's another one of those things that's like a lot of big mountain riding or Tahoe. It's all timing. It came down to like it's really good that he backed off that first day because if he did try it, he probably would have got taken by a slough Mm -hmm. and maybe carried over the cliff. And it was flat light. I mean, who knows what a rescue scenario would have been like. It was just Aaron Sedway and I, and he was shooting photos. And um, yeah, it's just one of those things. It's all timing. Man, the amount of times that guy has put his life on the line in some fuck lines and spines and everything. And just hearing that, that he actually called it off first and the intuition of knowing, oh, I don't feel good about this. You know, it just comes from so much experience. Uh, What's the most memorable moment you have filming Jeremy? Probably this thing called the convex roll, and that's in um, it's in Tahoe, South Shore, and it's in Paradox, and um, it's this big convex roll to a cliff band, and there's all these different ways through the cliff band, and it's one of those situations where it doesn't fill in every year, it has to be the right year, the right conditions, the avalanche condition. You have to have basically no avalanche conditions because it's the the way the roll is and the cliff, and the, you really can't even imagine the thing avalanching because it'd be too gnarly and that session that morning was probably the most memorable moment in paradox when he i think he does four different lines down that and it's just one of those things too where you got the camera set up oh i did one line snowmobile around the back quick little 15 minute hike up the back little thing after you get dropped off do another line oh now i'm going to step to this line i'll step to that is this one of those mornings where just where you basically shoot two minutes of the movie in two hours and you might have shot for three weeks before that, gotten two clips. Mm-hmm. You know, just one of those mornings where the whole thing just all the stars align and just it's just game on. I was thinking of uh, the the clips in my head. I can see it of when he gets roped in and dropped off from the helicopter on top of the line. Yeah. What I couldn't find. What video is that in? 
That's what, so TGR shot that. Okay. And I believe that's wh- uh, white balance. Oh, th- okay. Yep. That would make sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I don't think you can get away with that stuff anymore. The roping in and stuff mm-hmm. and the insurance, the, I don't think they'll let you do that anymore. Maybe. Wild. It's just so he, there was no access to jump out. So it was just rope them in. And yeah. I think that's why they did that. Yeah. I mean, it was such a little teeny, little teeny pinnacle. Yeah. I don't know exactly why that happened like that. Cool. Well, we got a guest question. From the man himself, Mr. Jeremy Jones. Here we go. How's it going, Mike? Jeremy Jones here. Super excited to hear your interview. Uh, you've been instrumental in my life and so many other amazing snowboarders' lives. Um, you've seen and documented some of the best snowboarding in the world for over 20 years, and then you took this long break from shooting snowboarding, and now you're back with this new film. And I guess. My question is, how? what are the changes you've seen um, with the riders, with the mountains? Um, I know you're back in Alaska, going back to these different runs with glaciers that you were back at 20 years ago and saw a change. And just overall, um, in the whole sport and, and riders' approach and, and level of snowboarding that's going on today, opposed to, say, 20 years ago. Thanks. Look forward to hearing it. Cheers. Cool. Um, well, Alaska for starters, um, I, f- it's, ch- I feel like the conditions have changed up there for n- just not as many good days. Um, I don't know if it's maybe global warming probably is, but, um, not as many good days, bigger storms, more wind, um, and just not as many perfect bluebird days. And, in in that, and it could be, and that even goes to Tahoe and Utah where you get these like whatever, 10 foot dump and then three weeks of clear. And then that just doesn't, doesn't seem like that used to happen. And when, but last year being the exception was an amazing year where it was like a perfect year in Utah in Tahoe. So the wet, but the, I think overall the snow has changed for sure. And, um, the riding I feel like has continued to progress in, certain areas but the film making part of it is still rad you still have you know fleeting time coming out and arc and there's movies coming out yearly but i feel like the momentum of, on the filmmaking standpoint in the last 10 years is the vibe is not the way it used to be when there was the big premieres and maybe social media has changed that and all that but i feel that has changed like whatever 15 years ago when Mac Dog was making movies in Standard and Abstinence and Whitey, there was like this big, there was like this anticipation when the movies would come out and everyone's waiting to see so-and-so's part. And it, it, there's so much, um, so much was put on a video part for a writer that could make their career off of a video part. And I don't see that being as much. It's more. It seems like it's more watered down now by the brands, and they're doing their own videos. With maybe, with maybe that's good or bad, but I feel like the independent filmmaker part of it's been extracted more, and it and it puts a different twist on a video when it's done by a brand. When you have Mac Dog Productions making a video, and you got Jeremy Jones, J.P. Walker, whoever, all these incredible snowboarders in a video, and you're waiting to see their parts. Mac Dog has nothing invested in the brands. He just wants to make a dope movie. So that's where I'm seeing that that part of it's a bit of a disconnect. I'm not saying that brands can't do good videos and the, the short form content that it is out there, but there's nothing like a 45 minute video with all banger video parts with the best snowboarders in the world cut to dope music. And that just to me, that is like the pinnacle of snowboarding. You could win all the contests you want, which is great. You can. Sp- in a half pipe in a, in a snowboard park, but nothing is more legit than a video part that shows the rider's true ability on a snowboard and it shows how big their bag of tricks is and what they can and can't do on a board and how good someone really is on a snowboard. And it's not a judged event. You compile, you work all year to put all your footage in this one spot for everyone to see it at one time. And that's one thing I feel like is it, I wish it would come back. I feel like these things can live together. You can have social media content, these Instagram clips that show something, but I really want to see the movies come back. And I'm not saying that in a selfish point for me just to go out and do it. 
I just think it's a good, healthy environment when you have multiple film companies all out there shooting movies and everyone's like creating this cool vibe. So, yeah, and, that's... And then thinking about, like, what about the writing? Thinking about that particular dude. Great points. I love, I love all that, everything you just said. And then I think about you filmed Farmer in 1989 or 1990, hit the Baker Road Gap and do... Uh, a method basically and and you've just seen this like progression 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 where do you feel like we're at with like riders progressing now i think that the riders that the video parts need to get more real again and i feel like there's sh some of the shit's honestly kind of soft it's getting put out there and i'm not trying to talk shit on people that are doing great stuff but i think there's a certain level when it comes to filmmaking and video parts that shit stuff should be at and i think that Sometimes the stuff's a little soft that's getting out there. What what is ex what I would consider even a shot that could should make a movie or shouldn't. And obviously snowboarding's progressed in the park and the pipe crazy. But even you know, as everyone says, stuff has gotten to be almost kind of gymnastic with these coaches and these guys with no skate style and pushing that stuff too far. It's like we need to kind of keep it real. Like this is snowboarding. Um, I don't think we necessarily always need coaches. It doesn't always need to be some contest. It's like some of that stuff to me is over the top and we need to like reel that stuff in, keep it rad. It's insane what people are doing in the half pipe. It's insane what people are doing in slope style. I mean, look at what's going down. It's totally insane. Some of it's kind of robotic and I'd like to see that some of that energy shift back into progressive filmmaking in urban environment and off kickers and, it's there, but I just I, sometimes I feel like it's getting lost in in this lost. Yeah, I mean, I not to play one side or the other. I'd certainly have my opinion, but you think of this these soft kind of entries, these clips that kind of make the cut that yeah. shouldn't, in our opinion, or others. If you have that, like, but the progression now is also like it didn't stop. So. Trick wise, there's so many better and like tricks are happening. Like why it seems like we should do less of this sort of soggy clip usage now because the snowboarding's actually progressed so far that like it's even more so a reason not to use it. Cause it's like, dude, you just separated your own like gap as an athlete. Like I can premiere this, but then I'll show this on Instagram. That's like, you know, I don't know. Does like, I don't know. Like, how do, you, how do we change that? I think we bring the movies back as much as possible and get, may, maybe it's not Mac Dog because he's probably over it, but I think we get, try and get the vibe back with three or four independent film companies out there. You know, Brown Cinema's doing their thing. Get these guys and get people concentrating again on video parts, you know, and really progressive video parts and get some of these guys to think of all the rad writers right now. You know, McMorris, Red, Ferguson, I mean... Blake Paul. I mean, the list goes on. Arthur Longo, John. There's so many good writers, and they they are putting out content. Yeah, but I think if it was like really back to the legit video part, I I think thinking about what if I, I was thinking about as you guys were talking too, because back then when you only have five videos, three videos, if you're in those videos, it's elite. The tricks. If you don't do something good, you're gonna cut it. Mac Dog's going to cut it. It's got to be of a certain caliber. Now, there are videos that are incredible that are coming out right now to this day. Like you mentioned Fleeting Time, the new ride videos, Unreal. We went to the premiere the other day. Uh, Brown will be great. You know, there's a lot of like Ar everything Arthur Longo puts out is just gold. There's so mm -hmm. much great footage that is coming out. But I think there is so much saturation of footage of small projects and there's a lot of mediocrity in the smaller projects and it gets, it just dilutes everything to where when everything's on YouTube, there isn't like, oh, these are the big videos. It's just everything comes out on YouTube. There's not like, oh, these five are going to the shop and they're the, vi the videos. So I think it's a degree of like diluted content. But in my opinion, the, the great videos still rise to the top, I think, agree. that are coming out I right agree. now. Yeah, the cream, cream rises to the top and yeah. You're right. It's just a little, little bit diluted and mm -hmm. just needs – people need to fo try and focus more on what the best of the best is. Mm -hmm. I think about that. Like you watch TB2, TB3. You might watch a video and there's 
footage that's worse than TB3 in there. There, it's like it's a good, it's a good landmark. Like, would this make it in TB3? No. Okay. Well, don't put it in your video part. Like, that's yeah. pretty simple, right? People should put on like, put on True Life. There's yeah. your, you know, put that as your. There's your temperature check and how good of a snowboarder are you? Put True Life on. Watch the watch that whole movie, mm. and then tell me what you're going to release on your uh, on Instagram, whatever. Like, ask yourself if those clips should go in. Mm -hmm. I like that. I do too. That's good stuff. Just to run through the catalog real quick. So start off totally bored, which is kind of TB one people might call it. Then you have the two FLF films that are iconic, and then you go TB two to TB ten, which all are incredible. You know, you got Slaz. You got Turier, you got Tom Burt, and then TB5, Johan is just electric. Downing is just shining in all of these. Mm -hmm. uh, and then TB6, and then, you know, TB7. I really love uh, KJ's part in TB7. That was, he had opener. Uh, he, do, he does a front 10 that's like insane. He does like insane back rodeos. Uh, it seems, I like kind of, I almost call that like the KJ era. How was it filming with KJ in those times? Amazing. I mean, Kevin, one of the best snowboarders around ever strap in. And Kevin's always been a really good friend of my brother and I's, and he's always been super fun to work with, hilarious um, on the hill, off the hill. And like I said, I mean, one of the best snowboarders around. So we, we always got great footage. And Kevin's got the whole, he's got the whole package. You know, he can slash power turns, he can free ride. He can do urban stuff. He can do cheese wedges. He can hit cliff drops. He's very, very well-rounded, really good snowboarder. I like that. Uh, Silk, let's hit some Let's hit some Patreons here. Um, why don't you pick? We forgot to... Our Patreon members basically uh, submit questions, and then we ask them on air. Fire something off. Sweet. Um, kind of on topic with what we're talking about. We have a question from John Martin. It says, what's your favorite movie you've done and what made it so special? And also, what's your favorite snowboard movie that you haven't been a part of? Mm. Um, TB2 is my favorite standard films movie. And what made it special was the first year that I got a chance to collaborate with Mac Dog. And... Um, putting together like an athlete based for the most part, an athlete based film with Mac dog back country, big mountain riding, um, mixed in with freestyle and, and just at the time too, I'd worked for FLF and then we had made, we started standard films and, you know, I felt like we like set this where we're going to set the standard. We're going to do this, so to speak. And to me, that was just a, for me, it was a monumental moment in my life being independent and not working for FLF, taking a chance on a business side and being nervous that we could even make the movie. Can we even do this? Is it, are we going to make money? Are we going to be able to pull, some, pull this off? So, so doing that whole movie was a, was, a, was a big deal for me. That was like a very big moment in my life to, to, to do that. It was, like a it was a stepping stone. I was talking to MDP McIntyre, and he, I mean, he shares – similar feelings to that time and but on a different thing it was you showing him 16 millimeter film and introducing him to that in that year and he was running the super eight before and he has just as fond of memories and like that that moment and what he you showed him in that space too is is really like he he leans on that a lot and he appreciates that that a lot and I thought that was a cool like insight too to you know I just always kind of thought MDP just knew how to use film because he's just been a snowboard filmmaker forever so like he just knew how to use it but then to hear that he learned it from someone and and that it's you and I think that's just really cool yeah that that was a, that was a cool time teaching him how to shoot sixteen that I'll always remember that and. Yeah, collaborate with him because I had so much respect for him and I, for the movies he had done, and just knowing that we, I could feel the energy. I'm like, this is going to be cool. Like, we're going to team up, and Mac Dog's a badass, and we got good chemistry. And this is, I feel this is going to be a good vibe, you know. Right. And, and it's just, uh, yeah, just so many funny stories from back in the days. And mm -hmm. yeah, I could go on. One funny thing was obviously we were on a super tight budget. We rented a beta SP deck. You know, you shoot on 16, you transferred all the beta SP. We had no money, so we had this tape deck. We rented it for a weekend. 
I think it was like um, 300 bucks for the weekend. It was a big deal. We had to digitize all the footage onto like media one. This was like before Final Cut Pro. We had to digitize all the stuff onto drive so we could edit with it all summer. So we only had 300 bucks for this deck. It was like a weekend and we had like, I don't know how many hours, like two and we had tons of footage digitized. So it was my brother and I, Mac Dog, and we had this leather jacket. We had to do like two all-nighters in a row and basically just keep this beta deck running and just feeding tapes. So we had to do these all-nighters and we basically had this leather jacket and that was like, you'd hand the leather jacket to the guy that had to run the computer like at three in the morning to five. So your shift and you just give him the leather jacket and we were so zombied out on coffee and stuff and we just had this leather jacket we would hand each other and that meant you were like in the driver's seat with the beta tape digitizing. So that was pretty, that was just funny, little funny story where we were just, I'll never forget the leather jacket with Mac Dog like handing it to Mac Dog like, here you go, dude, here's the leather jacket, it's 1 a.m., we'll see you at 3.30. Because that's how we stayed up. You had to let because it was like heavy metal. You had to like the leather jacket on. <laughs> you had to be like metal to stay up. And then, yeah. Um, yeah. So I just a funny memory. And I, I mentioned this, you know, True Life, probably my favorite video that I wasn't involved in. And um, and most of, you know, Mac Dog, you know, that singular video, True Life, and then a lot, a lot of the Mac Dog movies, super inspiring. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome to hear. You know, cool. in Whitey's movies too, I could go on and on. Yeah. Mike LeBlanc, two song parts. I mean, yeah. Mm. Awesome. Big list. I know you've been a part of this situation, which used to be more common. Uh, Jones, I think you've mentioned like getting your footage cut. Like you film all year, you think you have a part, 16 comes back, footage isn't as good as you'd hope. I know you've had to cut, people have filmed for you for the winter, and then the footage has come back and it's just simply not good enough. How has that experience been when you've had to tell writers, hey, this part you thought you had, you don't have? Mm. That's been uncomfortable and gnarly. Yeah, it hasn't been fun. And I've had some people, hasn't happened a ton, but I've had some people get really pissed off at me and some brands too. But it's just, yeah, at the end of the day, if you don't have enough good footage for a part or even a half a part, it just doesn't, sometimes it just doesn't make the movie, you know, and, you can have a friend's part, maybe three sh- show three shots of the person in like a friend's part, but if the person had a full part the year before, they might be getting pissed off, but you don't want the writer to look bad because if, if maybe they can come back next year and do something better. Mm. So it's, it's definitely been an uncomfortable situation, and I've been, um, you know, it's not, hasn't been fun. And I've been, you know, yelled at by people before, um, brands, writers. I've had been in some very uncomfortable verbal altercations with some writers that has has not been fun and as i get older i definitely feel i'm more sensitive to that when when you're 25 30 years old and you're kind of like in the moment you know you're more you're like you're whatever you're in the moment you're feeling like you're the man and you're, you're still trying to be i've always been a compassionate person i'm trying not to have an ego or anything like that but sometimes you're in the moment you're feeling like you're on fire and but as you get older, you look back and you're like, maybe I could have done that differently or tried to, I try not to get in that situation now from the get go. Like when we did the movie this year, I was like, I'm not going to shoot anyone I know is not going to make it in. And so that's kind of back then too, there was so much money in snowboarding in the nineties and the early two thousands. There were so many, only so many movies and everyone wanted to get their riders in. So we were getting pressured by brands Smith or whoever, some, you know, eyewear band, we got these three guys, you know, oh, UC's for sure in, like, no problem, but, oh, can we shoot this other guy? I'm like, well, I don't know if he's going to make it or not, but we'll shoot him, and then you get in this uncomfortable situation where it just puts you in a weird spot, and I definitely have grown more sensitive to it as I've gotten older. There was a perspective in there I wanted to highlight, and it was how much you think about the writers in that position. It's not just cutting footage um, that doesn't fit the video. There's that component, but also like the writer had a full part and now we're going to feed them three shots. And how's that going to look for their sponsors? How's that going to feed them into the next season? Like, is it better just to keep them clipped, call it an injury season and just keep eyes off them so they can start fresh without this sort of I think that was a cool element, like you're thinking things through and the writers are on your mind and just something to remember to all the writers out there when you are getting your shots clipped, like filmers and editors probably got your interest in th- in mind. Yeah. For sure. I think the filmers always do and the editors, it's, it's a collaborative effort and everyone's got to be trying to be on the same page and 
sometimes you just got to look in the mirror and be real, be real and say, I did, didn't work for me, but I'm going to come back next year, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. And there's a, you, if with any luck you'll have, if you're a snow professional snowboarder, you'll have a, a, a long fruitful career and you can just come back even stronger. Totally. You let riders edit their own stuff. A lot of riders are going to cannibalize their own video part because they're going to get attached to the clips that they think are awesome, mm -hmm. but nobody else thinks they're awesome. So I think in some senses, you know, I've seen it happen where I would see a part and you're like, why are all those clips in there? Rider wanted them in. They had to stay in. You're like, well, it's making the part worse. It's making the, it's like you're cannibalizing your own video part. So in some senses, you know, I don't know the details of the parts you're referencing, but uh, you're doing them a favor sometimes. Yeah. For sure. For sure. And then and some people too, on like, some people just aren't meant to be a professional snowboarder. Hmm. I mean, there's people that try and get in the game and there may be a B plus athlete, not an A or an A plus athlete. And there's only so much room in videos and in the snowboard world, there's only so much budget. And sometimes people just need to be like, tell themselves or maybe they're not quite good enough. It's an elite thing to be in a snowboard video and like a Mac dog movie or whatever. But I mean, it's like, it's a pedestal and you should be treated like that when you are, you know, again, even being watered down. It's like, hey, there's only so many people that are at this level. Danny Davis, Red Gerard, the, the list goes on and on. Ben Ferg, I mean, look at today's riders. There's only, these, pe these riders are the best riders in the world and they should be put on a pedestal that they are the best riders in the world. And people that aren't the best riders in the world maybe should not be trying to make a living out of it, you know? Or maybe they can be at a lower level having fun but there's let's 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 get real here on who's the best and who's not the best and if you're that gifted you're that i mean look at pro look at like baseball or football you either make the cut or you don't like it's there's no gray area like you're no. on the team or you're not if you're a pro golfer you're either the dude winning the money or you're you're not and snowboarding there's sometimes like this it's not there's sometimes we i think we could maybe do better at drawing the line maybe a little quality control action yeah a little yeah. qc yeah. qc yeah. yeah, that's good. You say it like it is. It's an yeah. interesting time because it's a sensitive topic. Everybody thinks they deserve more. Sometimes yeah. forget that you got to be better than the weekend warrior to get a paycheck. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Not everyone deserves to. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. are you better than the average person on the hill? Well, no, then you probably shouldn't be paid to ride a snowboard. It's pretty simple. I mean, yeah. I. <laughs> uh, true. Yeah. Yeah, that's good stuff. Uh, why don't you hit that second Matt Porter uh, Patreon question? We'll run through a couple right now. Yeah. Matt Porter's got a couple questions, but this one asks, how did you manage all the personalities of filming with pro riders year after year? Some pros are cool and hard workers. Others, not so much. Um, well, for the most part, everyone, most everyone I've ever dealt with has been cool for the most part. Everyone definitely has different personalities different moods and different things that make them click. Um, you just got to get to know the person. You got to get to know who's more sensitive, who's not as sensitive, who's what their strengths and weaknesses are, and just kind of just gel with it, really. You just got to be a team player. You know, you can't go into something and have an, have an attitude about someone because, you you know, it's okay to disagree with people and, and, and you know, just kind of got to – I don't know. You just got to deal with it. It's part of being like the producer or director. You got to, sometimes you're just so frustrated at Johan for not calling me back. But I know when he does call me back, he's going to throw down. So it's okay. You know, <laughs> it's just like being so mad at the dude for wanting to bail early or whatever. You know, it's just like, God, you're hard to track down. But it's worth it when you do, you know? Yeah. I like that. Uh, why don't you fire up that Lucy question? Yeah, we got a question from Sean Lucy. First, I want to say Mike is the undisputed GOAT filmer. It's a big claim. Heck wow. Yeah. Sounds like you're living up to it. This might be a hard question, but I would love to hear him talk about what happened after TB10. From what I remember, most of the crew left and started Robot Food, and Standard took the year off and made the best of TB series. I want to hear what happened and how he rebuilt when something like that happens. Great question. That's a good question. Um, well, we didn't take the year off. We did TB10 and we made Notice to Appear, which was our next video. And not the whole crew left, but a lot of it left 
um, Jess Gibson was one of our main filmers, and he took uh, Bobby Meeks, Chris Inglesman, Travis Parker, and UC with him. And you know, uh, Travis and you know UC and Chris were a big part of our crew, and um, that was a blow to Standard Films. It was unexpected. It was kind of last minute. It wasn't done in the best way, but I understand Jess's point. It, at one point you grow out of what you're doing working for just like I grew out of working for fall line. Like you just want to do your own thing. It was a little bit, it was very last minute. And it was hard for me to pick the pieces up, but we just, it, we just picked the pieces up. I'm like, I'm not going to let just the fact that those guys jumped ship and doing their own thing. I, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. I'm going to make it. I'm going to, and I got a hold of John Jackson. Terry a was back on board and, you know, we ended up, you know, just, picking the pieces up and making another movie and just it's just like it's like running a business it's not always going to be smooth and sometimes you're going to get dealt uh, you know it's not always going to be perfect and that was a it was humbling it was a good experience and um i remember Corey called me for, he was running he was working at smith at the time Corey smith and he's like are you guys making even gonna make a movie next year and i'm like thinking to myself like hell yeah we're making a movie mm. next year we're, no matter what, we're making a movie because it. But, but I had doubts. I definitely had doubts, and I, and I always I talked to Dave Downing because I would always kind of bounce stuff off of Dave because he's been a friend of mine for so long, and giving me a lot of advice. And he's just like, "Dude, you got this. Like, we're gonna make your standards not going down because Jess quit." And those guys, Robot Food, went on to make a great couple, three films. They were in and out, and Standard Films kept going past that. So it's just mm-hmm. like somebody's got to keep your eye on the long game. And just realize that sometimes, you know, and let people do their own things. You, you don't, you know, you train a filmer and they're probably going to end up doing their own thing. Tim Manning worked for Standard Forever and ended up doing his own thing and working for Burton. And that was another last minute decision that got dropped on me in December. And we just kept going, you know, and I'm still friends with Tim. I was mad. I was definitely pissed off at him <laughs> right after Paradox for about a year. I was pretty damn mad at him, but we're good friends again. And shit happens, you know, and it's, and and at the end of the day, it's business, you know, there's Mm -hmm. business and friendships and sometimes people have to make a business move and robot food made some cool movies. So yeah. Cool. Really rad to hear that explained. I always wondered about that kind of how how that time frame switched and then going back notice to appear, by the way, is a fucking great video. Like I, I watched that a ton and you know, maybe this isn't important to some people, but we used to rewind the switchback 10 hikey source that did in that like mm. over and over and over again, that yeah. blew our minds. Yeah. That Wild was, clip. Yeah. That's from Hemsedal. Yep. The, yeah, totally. Yeah. And that again, you, you know, he was in there just shows you, you pick the pieces up, mm-hmm. like you lose a couple of good riders and then you get, uh, you gain other ones and you got to understand too, that the professional snowboarders, they have careers they're trying to pay attention to. And sometimes it's not the best move for them to be in the same movie over and over again. And maybe Standard Films was getting stagnant from them. Maybe TB9 is probably one of my least favorite videos that Standard Films did. And you see all those guys are in TB10, yeah. which I think OptiGrab's a good, pretty Great good movie. Video. Yeah, I'm stoked on that one. TB9, the soundtrack, eh. I don't, I don't know. I don't even know what I was thinking during that time. But I'm not, that movie is a dud. And um, there's some good writing in it. I just don't like the way it's put together and the music and this, that, and the other. And I remember Mac Dog saying one time, he's like, he, I forget this video. He, forget what year it was. He's like, Mike, some of you just got to, you got to lay a dud out there every once in a while. Just pulse. Yeah. <laughs> pulse. Yeah. And it's like, pulse I, cause I remember that. Like, yeah. Out yeah. I'm like, sometimes there's a dud every once in a while. So it just happens, you know? But yeah, mm-hmm. snowboarders. And I've learned, you know, you build friendships with these riders when you work with them. And it means a lot to you because you're all out there trying to achieve this big goal and people are risking their lives and you can get really hurt and it's fun and it's creative. There's all this crazy energy going down. And then, but you also have to remember at the end of the day, it's also business. You got to, I've learned as I get older, respect the riders, let them do what they want to do, say your piece and then move on because you'll, in the end, if you're meant to be friends, you'll still be friends. You know? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. You can't just, can't take it too personal. You know, it's just, it's just not worth it. Great advice. Yeah. Cool. Like that. Uh, and then we talked about notice to appear. We have white balance, real awesome translation paradox. Those were, you know, those ones really hit my, uh, demographic as a kid. I had those just DVDs on repeat over and over again. And I think that white balance is a 
fucking incredible video. Thank that you. one really, the soundtrack, the riders. I think that's the Matt Hammer send me an angel part. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's closer. Yep. Matt that that's just an iconic ender. Uh John Jay, I you know, just he's hitting handrails at the time still. Like yeah. great, great video. Yeah. And the soundtrack, yeah, I'm glad you like it. Thanks. And the soundtrack, that's Mike Baganella, Bags, who works over at Yeti now, who whoever knows Bags, but he's a great guy. The soundtrack was just us going to the, like the record store and like reading reviews on magazines and going out and buying like fifty CDs and just locking ourselves in the office for like a week and just listening to music. Matt Hammer came up with he he thought of Send Me an Angel that was his pick, but yeah, the soundtrack was just go out and listen to music until we decided on something, and then we yeah we melted the ice we put all those logos in the ice and then melted mm-hmm. the we we those were time lapse shots we put the froze the you know, the, whatever, the Burton logo in an ice, put the, lo- put the sticker on the plexiglass and then put iced this, we had this big giant freezer and we melted it in these ice blocks. And then we shot time-lapse of the ice melting with the logos. And that's how like the intro of the movie was. So that was, that was fun stuff, you know? Yeah. It's so cool. I mean, you think about all these videos having to flex your creative juices every time to how are we going to do sponsor logos? What are the titles? What's the soundtrack? Like, that's just, incredible catalog of creativity right there you know it's got to be fun after all those years it's fun it's fun yeah and then this, this year i was stoked to have roto in the driver's seat on the editing because i've gotten older i know how to edit a snowboard movie but there's the editing's progressed so much you know the tricks that you can do and how jiggy you can get with all the stuff with the mm. speed ramping and all this other stuff and i just feel like it's just nice to sometimes ha- hire someone to do the editing and really get creative with it and because it's, it's hard, yeah, it's hard to try and stay creative every year and do things. It's just, it's a lot to, I've always felt like I was better at like running the business part of it and pointing the camera at people and getting the footage and doing the distribution and dealing with the sponsors and the writers. That's all second nature to me. Like I feel mm-hmm. like I can call up whoever on the phone and feel totally cool talking to a team manager or, or a marketing person or whatever. It, but the, the creative part of it, that's always been a bit of a struggle for me, trying to like get creative with the, with the music and the way stuff's put together. It's nice when the writers come in and they pick their own song. Like, I want to do this. Like, it's always cool when they get the writer's input. Now, going back uh, to some of the videos, I think that uh, I was looking at this writer list. You have so many Groms, too. You've broken out. I always remember the Mikhail Bang. I hate backflips. I hate backflips. I hate backflips. I love front flips. <laughs> and, you know, then even looking at, Maybe it's TB7 or Sean White as a Grom in your videos and stuff. Um, first of all, how was it filming Sean as a Grom at age 11 or, or whatever? It was cool. Yeah, Rich Van Every filmed a lot of that stuff. He's mm-hmm. an old friend of mine, and he filmed a lot of the early Sean White stuff. But it was cool. He was just a little ball of energy and just up-and-coming Grom with no nothing attached other than just wanting to shred on a snowboard and... Yeah, TB5 was our first one. I think he was, say, eight years old, maybe, on the first mm-hmm. clips. And then we, him in TB7, he does the rippy flip in TB7. Yep. And um, just kind of watching him progress through all those early. He was just a little little kid. Yeah, totally cool. And then thinking about, I think it's lost in translation. You got, like, Luke Matrani, Mickle, Freddie Ostabo. Um, they're all Groms. And then Kazu, even when he's younger, you know, filming with the Groms was a constant for Standard, which is always really cool. Yeah, that was super fun film with the Groms. And that was Downing had a lot to do with that. He was oh, like, cool. yeah, you do a Grom Seggy and like totally. And then Bags helped me edit that stuff in the in, in Lost in Transition where we do the the freeze frame, you know, yep. on it on the intro. And that was all Bags' idea to freeze frame it and um super fun just bringing the energy of the young kids into the sport and um you know, I mean, are people going to like this? Are people going to think we're being like corny or is it going to be cool? And Downey's like, this is so dope. And Bags loved it. And the snowboarding was good. And obviously the Groms and the kids are the future of the sport. So it was a, that's, I mean, that's an awesome move. It's a progressive move to throw in a video at that, at that progression of snowboarding and the, that level of athletes. And then to take a risk on just some little Groms that, really are good snowboarders, but learning still. Yeah. And it, it, they've got far to go, but present them well and in a good light, and it actually supports the video. That's 
I mean, that kind of, no one was doing that. No one really still does that. Yeah, not a lot of Grom. Honestly. Not a lot of Grom seggies. As a kid, we, I was the same age as those kids, and seeing them in there, I, like, I fucking loved it. You just, it was I doable it. now. You're like, damn, these guys are the same age as me, and they're doing 900s. This is insane. Yeah. yeah. It was yeah. cool. I liked it. Now look at them all. Oh, I my know. God. <laughs> Unreal. Now look at Mikel. It's insane. Yeah. Powder God. Um, I got another Patreon question I wanted to tee up. This is from Benny Pellegrino. Uh, shout out to our Patreon members. We appreciate you guys. Uh, he asks, Mike, tell us who the goat of AK shredding is. Mm. Jeremy Jones, pretty much. I mean, I could go on. I could list others. But, I mean, if I was going to say the one the one guy, Jeremy Jones. And it, it back to his, just to his ability on blind convex rollers, slough management, the whole package, mm-hmm. riding above exposure, knowledge, knowing when to wait for the right time to ride something, going fast is hell. Like Jeremy went, does go, he went so fast down shit, like reckless abandon, you know, down stuff, outrunning sloughs, above exposure. There just hasn't been yeah, there's been other guys. There's other guys now, but if you were to point back and say, Jeremy, you know, another topic that uh, really hits near and dear to the childhood hearts <laughs> was a little thing called Fuel TV. Used to love that. Uh, I remember you guys had a bunch of footage for Fuel TV. What was that for? Um, damn, early two thousands. Yeah, for multiple seasons. Yeah, right. we did uh, eight seasons. Eight seasons. Yeah, the standard snowboard show. Yep, pretty fun doing those. Yeah, that was. Um, Interesting, fun time. Yeah, Sean Tomlin was the one, one of the main guys at Fuel, and he approached me through Jimbo Morgan. He got uh, Tahoe Loke, old friend of mine, um, ex speed skier, and um, he asked me to do if I wanted to do TV shows. And I'm like, I've never done a TV show. I have no idea how to do a TV show, and I frankly, I'm not even really that interested told him at first and he's like he came back to me a couple times he's like you got this library we're doing this thing fuel tv i want you guys to make a snowboard show so we went back and forth on it a couple times and he's like i'm like well i don't even know how to do one he's like well there's a cold open and there's like a bumper i'm like what's a cold open what's a bumper like what's a cliffhanger like all these terms i'd never even heard of and he explains to me you know cold opens the opening of the show bumpers before commercial cliffhanger you kind of go out on a cliffhanger so when people go to commercial they come back to watch and he explained to me the format and started doing these shows, and it actually ended up being a really fun thing. Yeah, eight seasons. I think we did 59 episodes, 56 or 59 wow. episodes. All these cool rider profiles and travel profiles. And it ended up being financially a good thing to help us because snowboarding, you know, we were starting to sell less and less DVDs, and then the TV show was kind of a good injection of a little bit of extra cash. And it was able us to bring – it made it so we could bring the production level up on the movies a little bit, like having a, uh, someone there on DV cam always filming lifestyle content for the TV show. And it kind of made it fun. Like, oh, we're going to go to Montreal to film with Haldor and Torstein, but we're also going to shoot, like, a TV show while we're there. So it was kind of a never a dull moment. Like, you're going to go shoot bangers of Torstein for his part. Oh, it's a day off. He's tired. I'm going to go shoot scenics all day and interviews for the TV show. So it kind of made this really fun workflow. It, it's standard and it employed extra people. And there's crazy with all the deadlines and the cue sheets and the you know you have to put all the. It was a lot of work. Music clearing. Music. Well, they gave us music clear that we would just use. They okay. had library music, but we had to do like a, you know, we had to whatever you know put all the English everything that was spoken in the show had to be all typed out word for word with time codes and it was Fox. They had big deliverables, you know, for us. It was a good learning process for me. And like I said, it employed a lot of people. It taught me how to make, produce and direct a TV show. It taught me how to deal with the execs at Fox and to be pro and, you know, how to like just do the whole thing. You know, it was definitely a, a good, good learning experience and it upped my game, you know, knowing how to do stuff. And it was fun too. And the writers were stoked because it was a snowboard authentic TV show. First you talked to them and they were like, 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 dude, this is the standard snowboard show. It's just a TV show about snowboarding. And you, you know, fuel was a cool, cool oh, thing. Yeah. Yeah. I had that thing on all the time as a kid. Surf, skate, snow, totally cool. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. That's really cool. So then uh, just wrapping up the catalog of standard, you got Draw the Line, Catch the Vapors, Aesthetica, Black Winter, The Storming, TB20, and 2112. Um, man, like just thinking about, I mean, there's, there's a, even in that, there's just so many incredible careers. I think about Torstein coming on the scene and going absolutely bonkers. But my main question is just like, you know, that many years of making videos, just how do you stay motivated and inspired? I love, I love snowboarding and I love filmmaking. So the kind of the motivation was there just to, ingrained in me to, and, um, but I did get the end. I did start getting burnt out. Yeah. It, when we made 2112, I'd kind of reached my, I feel like my creative plateau and just waking up at 5 a.m. again and sticking out snowmobiles and, you know, they, it, 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 I had to start digging deep at the end there to keep it going. And I never got into snowboard filmmaking for to make money. Like when I first started doing it, I was like, great that it turned into like a financially being able to put food on the table and pay the, pay the bills. But um, at the end, the DVD, DVD sales started going down so much and people were starting to consume their stuff online. And when then the financial part of it started, basically the business model disappeared. It wasn't even viable to make a move anymore. I mean, MacDog got out of it a couple of years before me and he's like, I saw the writing on the wall. I was out of there. He told me, he's like, that, that was a hit too when you just can't, I'm going to shoot this movie all year and make $17,000. Like that's why 2112 was my last movie. I'm like, I can make more money doing other things and I got a family to provide for. I can't do this anymore, you know? So and it, it got, but the stoke was always there on the filming aspect of it you know it was hard work but you're always stoked to make always stoked to get out there with the riders mm -hmm. you know and also sometimes the the risk factor watching people get hurt or mm -hmm. almost get really hurt starts to weigh on you a little bit yeah. like hitting cheese wedges and watching someone scorpion trying something and you're just like this is so brutal mm -hmm. yeah. and as you get older you're still just a revolving door of 18 year old kids chucking yeah. off of cheese wedges and you're like one day you're like, damn, right? Yeah. I can see. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, what about, I just think about when I look at this last kind of stretch, I mean, also like Lonnie Cock was amazing in there too. He was like doing cab 12s before anybody and stuff like that. But uh, what about filming like Torstein kind of earlier stuff? So sick. Yeah. Sean Lake introduced me to Torstein and Haldor. He's like, I got two guys you probably should think about shooting. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, that sounds good to me. And and I, he told me about Torstein. He, he said, you know, basically, he's like, Spike, this guy's probably one of the best guys on a snowboard right now. Like, just going to give you a heads up. And once he, once he said that and, you know, I did a little bit of research and, and, like, and, yeah, that was just insane. I mean, after a week of filming with Torstein, I pretty much knew that Sean was right, you know, and he's just a total machine. And what was his learning curve in the powder? Very quick. Nice. Very, very quick. Yeah, I know he's just – in Torstein now, I mean, he's so yeah, – he, he was very quick and super motivated. And also he's like, he's like a producer too. He's like a producer. He knows what he wants to do. Yeah. He knows exactly how he wants to do it, what it's going to take to do it, and he'll just lay it all out for you. Like it's, it makes my job easy because he's like, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do it. Like, dude, that sounds rad. And he had that from early on. He had that, but he got more as he got his confidence built up. He just got better and better and better at the other end of just besides just doing tricks on a snowboard. He got better, better at all the other stuff, and just total machine on all aspects. So you know, sick, so sick. And he, he's got great style, stomps shit, insane bag of tricks. Knows how to free ride. Like, there's just. I don't know. I get stoked when I look back and go, look at these people I got to work with. You know, yeah. You know. I mean, if you go back to Damian Sanders, yeah, all Dude. the way, <laughs> yeah. you know, to Torstein and Haldor, and yeah, that's what a what a freaking encyclopedia of incredible snowboard clips you've cataloged. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I got. And I'm just lucky. I feel like I was in the right place at the right time. You know, I have my camera. My brother got me into snowboarding, and oh, this is. Damien Sanders, this is Kidwell, this is Sean Palmer, and oh, snowboarding's pretty cool. Like, it just, yeah, just kind of felt, I just felt like I was in the right place at the right time with a camera in my hand and some motivation. It wasn't, wasn't pre-planned. Right. But looking back, it's kind of crazy to think snowboarding was 
that's like what it actually first kind of started happening. Yeah. And it was like, but it wasn't, yeah, it's trippy to rewind the clock and think of it, really. It's, all, it's amazing. Now, we're going to get into uh, the pub beer crapshoot. You just roll these dice, and then there's a list of things. I'll tell you what you got to do. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this is brought to you by Pub Beer. So it's time to roll some dice for some cheap, fun beer presented by Pub Beer. No matter what you're doing, cracking open a pub beer for cheap fun is always a safe bet. Now go ahead and roll those dice, and we'll give you a quick. What'd you land on? One and Six is a goon gear, so you got a seven. Is that what you said? Yeah, so yeah, seven is who's one of your favorite people to party with? To party with. Oh. Can I go way back? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Great Pro- question. Probably, uh, I'm going to go back to high school. Greg Niper. Greg Niper. <laughs> Let's give Greg Niper an air horn. Oh, he gets a homie's cooked. Oh, I like yeah. that. Homie's cooked. All right. <laughs> Greg yeah. Niper, good partier? Yeah, old friend of mine. He, uh, he owns a scuba, scuba dive uh, shop down in North County now in Encinitas. Great guy, um, original metalhead with me, you know, Judas Priest, like I was saying earlier, Iron Maiden, all the shows. His dad was a, his dad's still alive, he was a lawyer, and he lived out in Rancho Santa Fe. I lived on the coast, and we had, like, the Rancho guys had the more of the, they were a little more well-off. And they had this gigantic mansion out in Rancho Santa Fe, and his dad, since his dad was a lawyer, he would always travel. And he, Greg had this Toyota Celica, and... His dad was always out of town, so we would just go over to, over to his house every weekend and sit by this gigantic pool in this $15 million mansion and rage, <laughs> completely go off the Richter scale raging. And, um, and then, yeah, he had, a, he had this Stella and there was this jump in Del Mar. There was this, this <laughs> he would, you kind of go up this like tranny and flattened off. It was like this tabletop jump for a car, and he would just go into it like, 50 miles an hour and catch like six feet of air in this Stella and just bottom it out and... Yeah, Blow the oil sounds thing. like a good sounds like a good time. Old time, yeah, like an amazing time. Yeah, drinking beers. I wouldn't imagine. Yeah, we were we weren't smart though back in the day drinking. You know, drinking beers and driving a vehicle and stuff like that was stupid on that part. But we we kept most of the when we got really wasted, we'd be at Greg's house. We weren't total idiots. We usually he'd usually catch air when he was pre waste pre waste. But yeah, it was always fun. Greg Niper always a good time and had a bunch of other friends from Rancho and the surfers because we had like the you know the jocks and there was the ska guys and there was the the punkers. And I was kind of friends with everybody. There was like mm. EG, Eden Gardens were my homies that all grew up that had like the you know, Hispanics. They had the Mexican restaurants, Fidel's, all these really good. And we were all total bros. And, um, and Niper's house was like the where we'd all kind of hang. Niper. Niper. Shout out, Niper. Shout all right. Out. We're going to get into Hot Takes. Hot Takes is presented to you by Oakley. Now, they got a new helmet, some new innovation in their Mod 3 helmet. It's absolutely beautiful. I've been running the Mod 1 Pro. I'm very happy with that helmet. They also have their event, Oakley Community Days. It was up in Park City last year. We had a blast. Not sure if the dates are announced for it this year, but be sure to check out Oakley Community Days. And lastly, you know, when it comes to goggles, I run the Line Miners. You can't go wrong. Rain, sun, sleet, hail, fog, you're good to go. All right, let's get into Hot Takes presented by Oakley. The first one we always ask is, in your opinion, who is the goat of snowboarding, both male and female? Hmm. Terry Hawkinson and Victoria Jalouse. Great answers. Uh, In your opinion, is snowboarding an art or a sport? Art. Thank you. Good answer. Uh... Do you want to elaborate on that as uh, being a filmmaker or no? Um, just that it's uh, there's style and it's got a sport kind of you got to be athletic to do it, but it's more of a it's more about style and just there's like the whole package of snowboarding. It's like you're in it's it's everything, you know. Jamie Lynn, I don't know. There you go. It's not a sport. It's you know it's an art. Great answer. Actually, it just says Jamie, Jamie Lynn's Lynn. name. I yeah. mean, Jamie Lynn. Yeah. yeah. Is it go. is it art or a sport? Uh, mm-hmm. Jamie Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Good stuff. Okay, uh, steel as in handrails or powder? 
Um, what do I prefer? Powder. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong answer. I, th- I thought uh, I thought that's what you'd say. <laughs> Who's got your favorite style ever? Favorite style ever? Another tough one. Mm. I don't know. Maybe Nicholas Mueller. Mm. Probably. Fair answer. Best method. Jamie Lynn. Favorite video ever made. True life. Favorite snowboard graphic of all time. Noah Selaznik skateboard graphic. Great one. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you could go heliboarding three people, just good times, no camera bags, who, what three people are going in the heli with you? <laughs> with me? Probably uh, Dave Downing, John Jackson, Johan. Hmm. If you can get him on the phone. If I can get him on the phone, yeah. Okay, uh, what is your dream sponsor? Dream sponsor? Um, a surf, an everlasting surfboard sponsor. Christensen? Yeah, that's my... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I like that. Christensen, yeah, I think he's my dream sponsor and just making me quivers the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. Sick. Not big quiver, just four boards a year. That's what yeah. you need. Yeah. We wouldn't be able to make this happen. I think yeah. so. Last question, worst trend? Uh... Social media. Do you want to elaborate? Um, more like just TikTok and people being on their phones too much. I like it. Yeah. yeah. And I agree. Okay, we also do uh, setups. So I think it would be cool for you for setups. Instead of talking about your snowboard, you can talk about that too. But what's your camera setup you run these days? I've been running uh, a red Gemini and... Um, Back to the Canon lenses, 16 to 35, 24 to 70, 70 to 200. Just a pretty basic package with some batteries. Just nothing super elaborate, but um, that's the package I've been running. And then what about your snowboard setup? I've been riding a couple different boards. I, I definitely, I've been riding a Burton Hometown Hero and um, some Vans. I think Andreas Wig boots, I want to say. They're pretty damn dope. I have a Jones split board as well that I'm liking, and I got another Burton split board I'm liking, so kind of all over the place. What's your uh, setup on rock? On, on rock? <laughs> like a rock climbing setup? Yeah. <laughs> on rock? Yeah, like what? what's your rope, dog? Split. <laughs> got some Tiva shoes, a prana yeah. chalk bag, yeah, mm. stuff like that, yeah. No got, bad boy. Yeah, bad boy's not coming D- back out. Daglo, huh? bad Nut boy. Daglo, bad boy, yeah. yeah. Sco- uh, Daglo green skull pants, iridium Oakleys. Mm. <laughs> iridium Oakleys are back. Yeah, I've seen they're kind of always yeah. on. I've seen that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, and lastly, oh, there's two more things. One thing we always ask is kind of like, what's what's next? Um, hope I'm planning on doing another snowboard movie. Could be a two year project. Could be a two mm. uh, one year project. I'm talking um, right now, TGR about it. That's what's next for sure. Yeah, and then hopefully just, yeah, just hang with the fam and go into Baja. The, in the immediate future, I got Baja on my mind. I got surf in my mind. Premieres are coming up in October. A little bit of, I, yeah, some, some hard work for till mid-November, and then I got my eyes on the first northwest swells that start hitting and going to Baja and hopefully surfing some good point breaks with no people around. Mm, you'll get shacked. Yeah. Uh, lastly, do you want to throw out any thank yous? Um, yeah, definitely. Just want to thank um, Dave Downing for being a long, you know, lifelong homie, and Sean Lake too. Same, just for always giving me a good advice when I've had you know ups and downs, and those guys have always been there for me when I've been undecisive on my next move, and you know, kind of just a sounding board to me, you know, for, for me. And thank my brother for getting me into snowboarding in the first place. You know, my dad for making the dope batteries back in the day and always believing in my brother and I, even though we got in a lot of trouble when we were young kids, he always had our back when it was like heavy metal music and snowboarding and rock climbing. He must've been like, Oh my gosh, you guys seriously pick, picking this stuff with your life. Like, so yeah, my dad, and then thanks to Teton gravity research for, uh, let me do a, you know, collaborating with me to do a movie after taking a 10 year hiatus and having some faith in me to come out of the woodwork and make another snowboard video. Love it. Well, I just want to say thank you for coming and sharing your story with us on this podcast and all of the hard work, dedication, blood, sweat, and tears you put into snowboarding. 
over the past 30 years. We, we really appreciate everything you've done. So just had to say that. Thank you. My pleasure. Lastly, Jones, Silk, thank you guys for being you. My pleasure. Thank you, Chris. Thank good, you, Mike. Thank good you, times. Silk. It's an honor. And our listeners, everybody that tunes in, everybody that supports all of our sponsors, you guys fucking rule over and out from the bomb hole. What a good show. Nice clean little three hour. That ain't